Rajim Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alamin Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Maliki Al-Majid Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in Idin nasarad al-musaqib Nasarad alam ta'alihim Gairil ma'udu Yalihim walad dalin Uin tasaftihu Kajahu Allahu Nasarud min Allah Yufat mukari Wa nubashari al-mu'minin Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Kulu Allahu ahad Allahu samad Lami yalid Walam yulad Walam yakun lahu kufan ahad Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Kulu a'udzu Bahad bil falak Min sari ma khalak Wa min sari qasik Ini jawa qaba ومن شر النفاثات في الأقد ومن شر حاسد النجاة حسد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل أعوذ برب الناس ملك الناس إله الناس من شر وسوء الخلق الناس اللي هي وسوس في صدور الناس من الجن والناس إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تلم صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تلم سبحان ربي رب الجسر يا ما يسفون وسلام على المرسلين ولم دل الله رب العالمين كم كم نمام سي بشاب يو هاف ذا فلو بليز Lord God of power and might of all creation, you who have created this nation, the Gambia, and you who have planted each and every person in this land, the citizenry. We pray, Lord, that you will uphold us at this point of our democracy. Continue to guide, to protect, and to steer this nation forward to higher heights continue to diffuse all potential intention of bring about um, misunderstanding among the people we pray lord that we as a people will learn to dialogue with one another so that in dialoguing with one another we may come to common understanding as to how to build one another up so we continue to bring out the truth in the true Arab Sea. We pray, Lord, that those who will come here will only speak of what they know. This we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, um, Bishop. Uh, Council, I believe the technical difficulties have now been resolved and that we can continue with our hearing. Is that correct? If it is, you may proceed. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, and members of the audience. Uh, that is indeed the case. We've managed to resolve the technical problems. Uh, we hope that uh, they would not resurface as the testimony progresses. Uh, we have uh, the witness ready and waiting. It would be via uh, video conferencing. And uh, Maria Masingate would lead the witness. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I now hand over to Maria. Thank you. Please proceed, Council. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning, members of the audience. Obi-Wan, can we have the witness on the screen, please? Mr. Chair, may I indicate that uh, we can only hear the witness through the earphone, through the headphones. Uh, but uh, may I warn that there is this terrible hissing noise uh, in the headphones. So if it becomes unbearable, perhaps let us know and we see if we can stop the proceedings and try to solve the problem. This is a recording problem. Unfortunately, uh, we haven't still been able to sort it out but uh, there you have it this is the situation uh, I'm not wearing it head-on I am just putting it partially over my ears in the hope that I'll be able to reduce the hissing noise the background noise and at the same time hear the witness but uh, but this is the situation let's try to work with it and see whether we can resolve the problem otherwise we can ask the technicians to see whether they can channel the audio through the speakers if that is possible then we do that but in the past that has been not so successful so it it appears that we may have to content with the noise the background noise in the in the headsets so um, that's the situation so with your with your concordance mr chair we would proceed and see how far we can go with this Thank you for that warning. 
I believe I'm a, we will I'm a continue uh, and I have to uh, manage the noise that is them are coming. But I don't want to also stop the proceedings <laughs> again. Let's, let, let's go on. Council, please continue. Miss Maria Masingate would now lead the witness. Good morning to you, Mr. Witness. As you already know, my name is Maria Masingate, and I will be leading you on behalf of the Commission over the phone on several occasions. In the course of our interactions, I had explained to you your duty to speak the truth. I had also warned you that lying to the Commission is an offense. And I would like to reiterate that point. It is indeed an offense to lie to the Commission or provide misleading information to the Commission under the laws of the Gambia and by virtue of the TRRC Act. So I would urge you, as you give your testimony this morning, to speak the truth and nothing but the truth. Do you understand? So just before we start, I'd like to administer the affirmation to you. So you repeat after me, I. State your name, please. Sorry, you will say I, then you state your name. Affirm that. I will speak the truth. I will speak the truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. As you have already affirmed, the commission expects you to speak today. We are going to focus mainly on your involvement in the April 10 incident. We will first start with a few background questions and then we move on to your career progression and we will move on to the April 10 incident and the aftermath of it. Do you understand? So if we are, if we are good to go, we can start now. Can you please state your name? When and where were you born? Uh, I was born in October 21st, 1972 in Dipakunda. Can you please give us a brief summary of your educational background starting from your primary education? Please, if you can recall, provide dates. Okay. Um, I started my primary school at the Senegalese Primary School in Bangyol. That was in the year 78 uh, through the year 84, 1984. There after, there Just after, a moment, please. Just a moment. Okay. Mr. Chairman, the audio is quite clear. So, from the speaker, you can now remove the headpiece. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Right. So, I was saying that uh, my name is Mumudu Sise, and uh, I was born in October 21st, 1972. Um, in Dipakunda. Now, please, can you speak CC, into CC. the mic because we are finding it a bit difficult to get you. Okay. Thank okay. You. Can you get me now? Hello. Can you get me? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um. As I said, uh, my name is Mumudu Sise, and I was born in October twenty-first, nineteen seventy-two, in Dipakunda. Now, um, in nineteen seventy-eight. That's when I started my primary school 
uh, at the Senegal in Banyol through 1984. After my command entrance, then I proceeded to a military high school in Senegal. Under the name of the military high school is uh, Pretane Militaire of Saint Louis. There in 84, I went uh, all the way, you know, to GCE That was in the year 1991 when I passed out, you know, from that military school, military high school. In 1991, then I came back home in the Gambia because I was sent to that school by the government of the Gambia through protocol between Senegal. So 92, I joined the Gambia National Legendary Mori. Sorry, just a moment before you continue with your evidence. You said you were sent to the high school through a protocol between Gambia and Senegal. Correct, correct? Ma. Can you please tell That's us how that correct. selection took place? Okay, um, the selection uh, took place through um, competitive examination. And uh, every year of the school year, the Senegalese government will either give uh, three, five, six, depending on the space, number of students, you know, they, they can admit, you know, from other countries and the Gambia was among them. So in the year 84, I'm referring to when I was commanded to that command entrance. Successful Gambians who were accepted, and then we to the Gambia. What did you do? Right upon my return to the Gambia, then I joined the then Gambia National Zandar Murray. That was in uh, 1992. After a successful training. Uh, uh, in 1993, May 93, then I pass out um, uh, and uh, be among the best, you know, one of the best students. I pass out from the uh, Gambia National Agenda Mori under the administration of Turkey's. What rank were you when you, after your training? Um, after my training, uh, I was a, I, I passed out as Lance Corporal in 1993 May. Then there after two months, uh, we we had, you know, officers exam nationwide. Those who were successful, I was among them. I, in fact, I was uh, one of the best. I came out first, you know, in that exam. And then I was promoted to officer and then uh, was standing by to go for my overseas course, my officer's course. And where did you go for that officer's course? Right. Um, there after in 1994, April 1994, I went, you know, to the Republic of Turkey where I wonder, underwent, you know, my officer's training course. How long did that course last? Uh, that course started uh, in... Um, Um, 1994-1995, April 1995, then I came back home. When you came back home, did your rank change from Lance Corporal? No, actually, actually, uh, my rank changed when I, I passed, you know, the officer's exam and I was promoted to officer cadet before I go to Turkey. So I went to Turkey with my rank of officer cadet. After successfully... Uh, finishing my training in the Republic of Turkey, then I came back home, and then I was promoted to second lieutenant. I was given the rank of second lieutenant. And thereafter, what happened? Um, thereafter, um, I I was posted, you know, at the army headquarters because um, the time I went, you know, to Turkey, uh, the 1994. Um, uh, who took place and then the then Zadar Mori was amalgamated, was, was defeated in a sort of 
Some of the officers went to the police, the Gambia Police Force, and the other officers to the Gambia National Army. So we were a part of them, of course, who came from Turkey. And then when I came, I was posted, you know, at the Gambia National Army. And that day I was promoted to the rank of second lieutenant. And I was working at the army headquarters. And what was your role at the army headquarters? Yeah, at the army headquarters, I was uh, I was the operation and the logistics officer for six months before being I mean redeployed. Sorry, can you repeat that again? I said at the army headquarters, I was the officer in charge of operations and logistics, and uh, I was there for about six to seven months before being redeployed. Mr. Chairman, it seems as if we're back to square mm. one again. Oh my God. Ah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hey, thank God for that. Ah, great. You were telling us about your redeployment. Can you proceed with that? Yes, please. Yes, so. Uh, um, in 1995, then I was redeployed you know, to the Gambia Police Force, and then uh, I was sent to the police uh, to the police training school as an instructor. Can you tell us how that redeployment took place? Was it by choice, or were you posted? Uh, it, was, it was not by choice. It was not my choice. Uh, um, uh, the then the then government and the then Security Council. Uh, when I was called from uh, uh, from the army headquarters, I was told that uh, the police, the Gambia Police Force or the government has intended to form a unit called Police Intervention Unit. And uh, for that being the case, uh, I was the one who was identified to, to be moved from the army to the, to the police. And when was this? So that was, uh, that was in 19... Uh, uh, when was that? In 1996, 96, 96, uh, January. Go on, please. Yeah, in January 96, so I was moved to the police uh, training school as an instructor, where I um, my duties was, you know, to to train a, a badge of police intervention. And at the police training, the first badge where they were not first um, officers, they were old conquest officers who were already in the police force that were selected from different units and the police station um, uh, nationwide, all over the world, all over the country. Can you please tell us what that training entailed? Okay, that training entails uh, um, uh, VIP close protection, border patrols, Crowd controlling, sentry duties, intelligence and uh, counter intelligence, you know, um, training, Milit police uh, police leadership training, communication, map reading. So these were the subjects that I was supposed, you know, to train to for, for those um, officers identify. Um, the areas you mentioned, will that then be the component of the work of the PIU? Yes, it's part of the component of the work of PIU. Uh, a, a point of correction, did I mention also, I mean, uh, to maintain law and order, that's public disturbances, if I don't, then it's part of it. Very well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, um, so, 
So that was uh, that was what I was uh, I was assigned as my duty, you know, at the training school as instructor. Did you remain at the training school as an instructor? Right. At the training school, when I finished the first batch, the, the one I told you, they were already trained officers who were selected from different uh, police stations and the units. When I finished with them, they just pass out and I still remain, you know, in the, at the police training school. And those pass out officers were sent to respective uh, uh, police stations and the unit nationwide in the country. Then in uh, the same year, um, I was, uh, uh, there was a, a French recruitment and uh, about 100 and, uh, 110, if I remember, it was 100 and something officers who were recruited for me to train them freshly. That will still be in 1996, right? Right, ma, at the, at the police training school as instructor still. Go on. Right. When, when I finished training those officers for about uh, six to seven months, then they pass out also from the police training school. And then uh, since the strength that the, the Gambia government was looking for was not uh, sufficient you know, enough, then uh, they, try, they, they keep them in the Greater Banjul area, that is in, uh, in Kaniping PIU, and then in Banjul, four lines. Will that be the first badge that is stationed at a permanent location in Kaniping? Very clear. That was the badge, the first station in Kaniping, and then in Banjul. However, however, those who were trained previously, those officers I was telling you, and that they passed out and they were returned, you know, to their respective unit, they were called as well to come and join, you know, those trained, you know, officers who station in Banjul and then select and then Kanifin respectively. And for how long did you remain at the training school as an instructor? At the training school, uh, immediately after the, uh, those, uh, those police officers passed out from the training school, um, it took me a few months and then I was moved to the police intervention unit in Kaniki. As the, as the, ofi as the officer uh, commanding intervention. Can you please pause for a moment? We are not seeing you on the screen oh. right now. Oh, okay, okay. Mr. Chairman, can we still continue given that we can hear his voice or we wait until he's projected on the screen? We still continue? Yes, I think we can continue if we're hearing. Um, the audio is coming on all right. Otherwise, <laughs> we're wasting time. Very well. Obi-Wan, in the meantime, can you please make arrangements to have the witness on the screen while we continue? Thank you. Yeah. Can you please continue, Mr. Njai? Yes, ma. Uh, now, I'm uh, in the same year, 96, after some months, yeah. I was uh, I was redeployed again a second time to, to the police intervention unit as the officer commanding. Sorry, you said for the second time. Yeah, for the second time from the from the army, you know, I was from the army redeployed, you know, to I mean, to the police as instructor at the police training school. So when I finished training these officers, this set of batch, the first one and then this last one, I'm redeployed again from the police training school to the police intervention as officer commanding. So as at this time you were commanding the same men that you had trained. Correct, ma. That's very right. And how many men were there? Um, I was having three platoon of men in uh, in Kanifing, and uh, each platoon uh, could have up to not more than thirty. Then I would say roughly about 90, 90 men under my command. Can you please? 
briefly give us um, your responsibilities at that time? Um, generally, my responsibility was to be responsible of the, the operation, logistics, and so on. Day-to-day uh, -day administration of, of, of the office, inclusive uh, the men, the officers that were under my command at that time. And what was supposed to be the major duty of the PIU? The major duty of PIU was uh, to maintain law and order, to protect you know, the territory, the integrity of you know, the, uh, the, the Gambia, inclusive you know, the people of the Gambia. And all other person, regardless of uh, nationality, tribe, or whatsoever. So that, that was uh, my main duty. Can you please give us a structure of the PIU as it then was? At that time, you started commanding the men. The structure of the PIU, I was uh, the commanding. And then uh, I, I had uh, three bones that were... And each platoon, you have a sort of uh, platoon commander. But at the headquarters level, at my headquarters level, I have my clerk. Then I have um, uh, other men also who are responsible for the admin and uh, responsible to dispatch the officers, you know, on duties. Plus my RSM, who's Babu Kadjata. And then it goes down you know, to the platoon commanders and then, you know, the, the three platoon as well. In the course of carrying out your duties, can you please tell us yes, what tools were made available to you? Right. To carry out my duties, um, uh, the tools that the Gambia Police Force has given us initially were um, uh, uh, buttons, Seals, helmet, tear gases, a PA system. These were the tools that were given to us. Later on, when we were given some supplementary assignment, that is, uh, uh, that was to uh, to guard in some bases in the Gambia under some of the key installations and the escort that we used to do in the Gambia. So that and, and that those places where the American embassy, the British embassy, Minister of Interiors, Residence, IGP, GPMB, Supreme Court of the Gambia, the Serenian High Com um, Ambassador, those days, the IEC chairman, under some cast escort and then border patrol. So when this thing was added uh, to our duties, then uh, the the command, the ARC deem it necessary, you know, to have uh, to have some, some weapon with us. Since the police was not having weapon at that time, then uh, my headquarters made arrangement with the army headquarters and that we were supply AK-47, Andrei Kalashnikov 47, for those duties that I have uh, I'm, uh, just, you know, I'm listed earlier on. Can you please tell us when exactly you were supplied these weapons? Um, I can't uh, remember exactly the uh, the date, but then it's in uh, 90, 96 or ninety seven. Actually, I have I have the uh, to be sure to be I mean I mean correct or accurate, you know, on my statement. I have the handing over and the taking over, which was given to me from the army when I was given, you know, those AK-47s and ammunition. But it should be um, uh, um, 96, 97. So between 96 to 97, you had weapons in your armory, right? That's correct. That's the time we start having, you know, weapons added to the one I have uh, said earlier on. Can you please tell us how those weapons were kept? Right. Um, those weapons, you know, were kept, you know, in an armory in the in Kanifi. And uh, I have the register of all those weapons. 
that is um, each AK-47 has a serial number. And uh, each serial number is unique. You cannot have, uh, I mean, one serial number for two, for two, two weapons. You always have unique, you know, I mean, serial number for, for each weapon. Like uh, this in the service, we have our regimental number. We can hear can you, so ahead? you can go on. Okay. So, um, uh, he was the one in charge of the, the Amori. And at each time, the weapons are out. I get out, you know, to, to discuss. It's, it's to be under my, my authority. There's nobody who can take a weapon from the Amori without my, my knowledge. And each officer taking a weapon from the Amori should sign for it. If you, upon, you are taken from the armory under the number of ammunition, you know, you are also given. And when you return back from your duties, you know, you return the same weapon under the same number of ammunition that were given to you. So basically, you had control over the weapons that were at the PIU. Very correct, ma. Sorry, I, I, I have somebody who's in charge. Sorry, I have somebody who is in charge, who's the Amora, but then I'm also supervising him. And each time a weapon is out, I'm aware. He cannot give a weapon out without my, my authority as well, without my knowledge. How about the other tools that were under your possession? That is the batons, the shields, and the helmets. Correct, as well. Since the seals and the helmet also were under his responsibility, but then they were not as strict as, you know, the weapons. Uh, we don't have serial numbers for those buttons, for those helmets, seals, and so forth. We don't have serial numbers, but then we have, I have the number of seals that are there, number of buttons, number of helmets, and so forth, and so forth. And I can know at each time whether a seal or a button is missing as well. So effectively, you had control over all the tools that were under the purview of the PIU. Quite, ma. I have a, a, a total supervision on to, of those tools. No one can take them without my knowledge. Nobody. Would you say that the tools that were supplied to you were proportionate to the men that you had at the PIU? Yes, ma'am, they were proportionate to the men that I had at the PIU because they were trained how to handle, I mean, arms and ammunition, buttons, seals. My correction was, let me rephrase it again. The tools that were provided to you, was it sufficient for, with respect to the number of men you had under you? Hello, Obi-Wan, can you please help us? The image is frozen. Hello.
Mr. Chairman, we are experiencing internet uh, connection issues right now. I don't know when it will be resolved. I think it's the internet from the witness. Shall we continue to just wait and uh, see if they can resolve it? Very well.
back now. Yeah, I'm back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hello, I, I can hear you. Yeah, I'm there. Mm -hmm. Hello, Miss Anjai. Yes, ma, I'm, I'm there. Yeah. Obi Van, can we please have the witness projected on the screen? Hello, Miss Anjai. Hello. I can hear you. I can hear you, Ma. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear now. Can we proceed? Okay. 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 Um, uh, as as I said, uh, uh, the police the police officers were well trained. Uh, they they were trained how to handle and to manipulate those weapons and the equipment that were given to them. And at each point in time, if you mishandle the weapon or any equipment, then you will be punished for it, depending on the degree of you know the the, the offense you know that you the person has committed. And in fact, you were the one that provided this training to the men that were <coughs> operating directly under you, right? That's right, Ma. With the help of the Gambia National Army, I was the one. Yeah, that's right. You've told us about the tools that were under the command of the PIU. Can you tell us right, how the command structure of the PIU was? You've told us that you were the officer in command. Can you give us the other structures mm -hmm. as well? Yeah, that's that's what I have said. You know, I mean, earlier on, you you have okay, you have the um, the operation commander. Who was the the then operation commander who was Babukar Babukar Sau, Commissioner of Police? Then you have me, and then you have the the three platoon commanders. But in between me and the three platoon commanders, I have uh, I have my headquarters, a sort of headquarters. And in between there, you have back and the order officers you know who are responsible for the day-to-day -day administration of the of the office plus my sergeant major so this is how you know the police intervention in kind of thing was structured and the each platoon as well you have uh, you have like three sections for each platoon and the each section you will have a, a sort of a section commander or section leader if you allow me hello yes you can go on because we can hear you clearly okay Okay. Under each section, you have, you know, a section commander or a, a section, you know, I mean, uh, team leader. So this is how the, the unit was, was structured. In the case of um, reporting, who do you report directly to? Yeah, in case of reporting, I report directly to the police commissioner who was, uh, I mean, uh, Bob Carso. And who does Sao report to? Bamuka Sao reports uh, directly to the Deputy Inspector General of Police. And I'll assume that the Deputy Inspector General of Police will report to the IG, right? That's correct, ma. That should be the way. Now, in receiving your orders, does it go the same way from the IG, DIG? operation commander and then to you right that's correct ma that's exactly how it should be i don't receive orders you know from the ig or the uh, deputy inspector general of police however sometimes sometimes in some situation they can direct orders if the situation warrants it but then in the normal circumstances normal way it should come from the commission of operation uh just Give us an incident. In what situation will you receive a direct order from the IG or DIG? No, it has never happened. It has never since I was there as the officer commanding where I 
I deployed my men for a for a significant you know operation or duties and then received the orders from the deputy or the IDP. It has never happened before. So in all the instances that you were officer in command of the PIU, all your instructions came from the DIG, right? No, sorry, from the operation. No, from, the, from the police. Correct, ma'am. Now, can you tell us how these orders are conveyed to you? Okay, um, the orders could come to me verbally, and they may come to me also as a, as a written, you know, document. What we call, you know, operational orders. So these are the two ways that I can receive order from my commission of operations. In what instances do, would you receive an oral order? Um, it depends on the on the commission of operation. That's his own discretion. Because um, uh, I can't uh, probably tell him whether he should give me you know an oral order or a written you know order. But in any of the case, uh, uh, both cases is either oral or a written you know order. And I have received cases whereby I have written orders. I have received cases whereby I have also received written orders written or, or, or oral orders in um, following the right procedure how are orders supposed to come to you um in following right procedures both both procedures are right if if i'm given oral order by my my superior who is the commissioner for operation to, for example, let's let me say, um, uh, I need you to deploy, you know, some men to, let's say, to go for a stadium coverage, an event at the stadium. I mean, it's an oral order, then I will take it because sometimes he may even call me over the phone. I will take it. The same thing equally to an operation, probably another operation which um, he might write, and I receive also orders which are written also from uh, from his office, you know, to me, and then we execute them. So both of them are legitimate. So can you please help us understand what an order with respect to an okay. operation will entail? Okay, the, an, an, an operational order will entail um, uh, the nature of the operation. That is what kind of operation you, know, you are going to be assigned to. And uh, in that uh, operational order, you will, uh, you will as well have uh, the detail of the number of men. The, that you need you know to uh, to be given or to deploy you know for that particular operation it will entail you know as well uh, the equipment that you are supposed you know to to take you know for that operational order and it will entail even you know i mean the the use of vehicle if you are going to use vehicle or if you are going on a on a on a foot patrol or if you are going on on any other means it will entail all those things and in the order uh, the other thing is uh, they will let you know what you are so what is expected from you what you are supposed to do for that particular you know operation and can you please understand what an order what what you mean by what is expected of you that is um uh, what instruction the instructions we are supposed to be put you know in the operational order that if it is, um, uh, for instance, to go for a, uh, for a, I mean, let's say, I mean, public events, they will, they will put, you know, in the operational order, you are going there to maintain law and order, I mean, uh, protect life and property, uh, under, under so forth, under arrest, under detain, you know, I mean, uh, respect if, if you, if you are those are even, uh, basic duty of the police officer. So it's, it's always there. You know, as a police officer, you know, you have, I mean, those basic duties that you should know, even if they don't tell you in your operational order. So basically, every operational order standard should contain one. Let me read it out to you. The nature of the operation. The number mm -hmm. of men that you're supposed to take for the operation. Correct? Mm -hmm. The equipment yes, correct, you are supposed to take for the operation. Correct? Yes, yes ma correct, ma'am. If you're going to take a vehicle, correct? Correct, correct, ma. 
what is expected of you as in maintaining law and order is always there correct yeah protecting correct, life and property is always there correct correct, correct ma'am if you're supposed to conduct any arrest it would be written mm -hmm. or placed in the order right no it's not going to be placed in the order it it may not place on the order because those those i mean uh, protecting life um, uh, life um, properties arresting detaining you know and so forth those are basic duties of the police that every police officer you know is, uh, is knows about it you don't need to be told those are your basic duties so it's there as you carry on on your duties so you're saying regardless of the fact that it does not contain the portion wherein it states that you're supposed to protect life and property it is implied that in every operation you should bear in mind that you're supposed to protect life and property correct very very correct ma very correct thank you very much now we'll proceed to how long you have been officer in command of the PIU? Um, I was officer in command of the PIU up to 1998, June 98. No, uh, February 98, when I was, uh, I was selected to, to go for a peacekeeping operation in, uh, in Sierra Leone as a UN police officer. So in Sierra Leone, I, I, no, I'm saying Sierra Leone, in Angola, sorry, sorry, point of correction. Please go, oh, hello? Sorry, you can proceed because we can hear you loud and clear. Okay, great. So I said point of correction, it was not in Sierra Leone, but in Angola, the peacekeeping mission in Angola in 1998. So uh, I went, you know, to Angola, and uh, that was the time I left the country, and I went to Angola for six to seven months. Then I came in 1999. Upon my return, I uh, I was posted back. I was sent back you know, to the police intervention unit. That was in 1998, huh? Yeah, when I left the country to um, for a peacekeeping mission in Angola. Sorry, can you repeat your answer? Yes, I said yes. That was the time I left the country in 1998, and then I went, you know, to Angola for a peacekeeping mission. That's correct. And when did you return from the peacekeeping mission? From the peacekeeping mission, I returned in uh, 1999. Uh, if I remember very well, that was in February 99. I came back to the country. When you came back, what post were you given? Um, when I came back in 1999, I went I went back again to the police intervention as the police as the officer commanding the steel, you know, I mean the units. How long did you remain in that position? <coughs> uh, in that position, I remained up to 2000, 2001 again, when I was selected a second time to go for another peacekeeping mission in East Timor. Can you please give us the dates you went for the peacekeeping mission? Yeah, the peacekeeping mission in East Timor, that was in uh, January 2001 until uh, July 2002. Thereafter, what did you do? Uh, thereafter, in, uh, in 2002 to 2003, I was the, the officer commanding uh, Banjul International Airport and Brikama Division. And for how long did you remain in that position? Yeah, that's what I said. It's in 2000, um, 2002 until 2003 February, when I was the officer commanding police, um, Gambia, uh, the Birkama, Birkama Division, and then uh, the airport.
Banjul International Airport. And what was your next deployment? Uh, from there, my next deployment uh, was when I I was given a secondment because I went to a competitive exam again, and then uh, I was uh, I was given a job with the United Nations for UNDP. That was in two thousand and three February when I was uh, uh, given an appointment with the with UNDP in Cape Point, Banjul. What was the nature of your appointment? <laughs> I was a, a security officer as well. Basically, it was security duties. And for how long did you remain in that position and when? Uh, I remained in that position through 2004 March, when I had now an international appointment with the same you know, organization, which is the United Nations. Then I went to the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda in Tanzania. Can you please give us a date you had an appointment at the tribunal? At the tribunal, I was there on uh, March. My first day at work was March 2004, when okay. I went to the tribunal to take up my My apologies. For how long did you remain in that position? I remained in that position until uh, 2009. September when I when I went you know to another mission within you know the United Nations, which was I mean uh, uh, the Central African Republic uh, and uh, and the Chad mission. After your mission in Chad, where did you work next? Yes, after my mission, you know, in chat in, uh, in two thousand and ten, I was there until two thousand and ten December. Then I was moved again, redeployed again to the United Nations, you know, mission in Ivory Coast, you know, Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire. And uh, there too, I was there as uh, as a close protection officer as well for for five years. That will be till. 2015, right? That's correct. Till 2015, when I was again, I mean, redeployed to the United Nations mission in uh, Mali. And uh, I was there for another three months, which uh, all the way to uh, February 2000 and, uh, 2018, when I was moved to the actual mission where I am now actually with the United Nations in South Sudan. So you're currently working with the United Nations in Sudan, correct? That's right. That's right, Ma. Well, you've... And uh, can I, can I, can I yes. have a point of uh, a bracket, you know, on that? Okay, then. Yeah, as I'm, as I'm working with the United Nations, uh, I, I was like, I... I took my early retirement, so I was no more working with the Gambia government. I was, uh, I was now working with an international organization. And uh, even coming to this commission, I have to have an authorization because it's a, it's a private you know, activity. And uh, so for that being the case, anything that I'm saying here or anything that I'm explaining here has nothing, nothing absolutely to do with the United Nations. It's all about me when I was in the Gambia police force or in the army or in the Sudan. I was just a bracket. I wanted to. Thank you very much for that clarification. And that is basically why you are called today as a witness. And thank you for That's honoring right, the call of your country to come and reveal you, the truth of what happened. That's right. In 2000. So we'll go back to right. your position as the officer in mm -hmm. command of the PIU. Right, ma. Back. Hello, Mr. Njai, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, ma. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I can hear you very well, loud and clear. Back in April mm -hmm. 2000, what position did you have? Back in April 2000, I was uh, an assistant superintendent of police commanding the police intervention unit. 
As an assistant superintendent, you were the most senior personnel at the PIU, correct? That's very correct, Ma. I was the most senior um, personnel in PIU, was the officer commanding. As at that time, you've explained several conditions to us as to how the PIU works, um, the men under you, and the manner That's in right. which you carry out uh, your operations. As at that time, That's right. was that the case? Yes, ma. Um, as at that time, that was, you know, I mean, the case. I mean, uh, and that, that was how, you know, we were supposed to work, and that was how I was working with the police intervention unit until I leave, you know, the, the unit. Can you please explain to us the events leading to April 10th, as far as you can recall? Right. As far as um, uh, my rec recollections, you know, are uh, uh, the evening of uh, April, April 10th, that is on the, on the 9th of April in the evening, I was informed by my my police commander that I have mentioned earlier on, who's the police commission of operation Babu Karso. Hello. Yes, proceed. Okay. Now, um, uh, he he informed me that there could be there could be a, a demonstration stage by by students. Can you please? And, uh, for the... I'm mm -hmm. really sorry for cutting you off. Okay. But can no, you please no tell us when you were informed about this? This is what I'm saying is the even that was the evening of April 10th, the 9th of April in the evening. I was I was informed if I recall very well, but it was a day before April 10th by my commission of operation. In what manner that... was this information channeled to you? Uh, it, it was verbal mom it was verbal it was verbal and, and uh, I'm when sorry. i my apologies okay. again um sorry to cut you but you have to wait for my questions before you answer it that way okay. the okay, right. testimony can go on smoothly All right thank you at what time of the day did he call to inform you about this I can't remember exactly the time of the day, but I, I believe if my memory served me very well, it was, you know, in the in a, of the night. Can you please tell us what he exactly told you? Okay, what he, he had exactly informed me is that uh, students my state registration the following day, which was on the 10th. And uh, for that being the case, I should uh, prepare my standby, you know, unit that was the police intervention for any further deployment. This is what you know he told me as a as a at the first stage, and then uh, he told me as well, you need to prepare all equipment gears necessary, you know, for you to carry on. Those are the right gears and and so forth. I should then make them ready. So the instructions he gave you with respect to a possible demonstration, would you see that as an order from him? Right, ma. Right, ma. It's an, it's, a, it's an order. It's an instruction. If, if he asks me that prepare your men, prepare your equipment, and that there is a uh, likelihood of, uh, of, a of a demonstration stage by students. So it's an instruction, it's an order. Would that be an operation order? Yeah, yeah, it could be, yeah, it's an operational order because he already told me, I mean, to, to prepare my, my men and the equipment. So it, it has come, you know, from him to me. So from him, the instructions yeah. were, from one, that you should take care of your men and equipment, mm -hmm. right? That's Why right. those the only right. two instructions given to you? Uh, 
um yes ma if i remember yes those were the only two instructions prepare your men your equipments and then get ready you know for any further you know i mean deployment instruction as of as of you know the following day we were several times did you ask him to provide further information with respect to the order he was given yes i i did so i did so because um uh, i asked him in fact you know to let me know what what kind of demonstration who are the the exact you know people who wants to go on demonstration and why they were even going also on demonstration but then the intelligence you know probably was not enough much enough you know to give me all those details so i did not have any further um uh, information with regards you know i mean to that as far as you know the order that was given to you by mr sao or in sorry to go back in what manner did he transmit this information to you uh, no i'm not remembering but i think i believe i believe if my memory serves me well he called me but then i received i definitely received you know something from him because he was the one who informed me of the uh, of the i mean stage you know demonstration that was supposed to be carried out by by these students so he informed me he definitely informed me as far as you know where those orders written no they were not, there was no written order nothing absolutely written that was given to me they were all verbal and did you see the order that he gave to you as sufficient with respect to the operation that you're supposed to embark on yeah at that at that stage in time um uh, it was sufficient because um uh, uh, as a police officer i know the nature of uh, of the um, how to call it i know the nature of the uh, of what, what was really going to take place and the way it was going to take place and then i i think it was it was sufficient enough you know for me to prepare you know my men for that as far as you can recall did you receive or see any operational order with respect to the issue that mr sao told you over the phone um to be honest with you i haven't i haven't seen any written operational order or instruction with regards you know i mean to those you know duties that i was supposed to to carry out the following day i haven't seen any any operational order indeed what would you say then to the suggestion that mr so in fact did send an operational order to all the divisional heads and you as one of the divisional heads received an operational order for the april 10th incident um probably i'm not a divisional i mean uh, officer i was you know i mean officer commanding a unit but then i don't remember honestly speaking i don't remember receiving an operational you know i mean order but then it comes to the same um uh, whether i receive an operational order or i receive a verbal you know order as i told you at the initial stage you know of this uh, this session that i can take both written and uh, and uh, oral you know i mean orders. i could not definitely remember if so is the case it could be but i could not i could not remember it's, it's long time ago we do in fact have an operational order that was tendered before mm -hmm. the commission of inquiry into the disturbance of april 10 and 11. so we'll go back to that mm -hmm. in the near future but in the meantime okay. i just want to mm -hmm. go back to the order you received from mr so yes that particular order you received you did mm -hmm. mention earlier that it was sufficient for you right yes ma'am let's go back to the list that you provided for us with respect to what an operational order should contain mm -hmm. You did mention that it should contain the nature of the operation, correct? Yes, 
Mm-hmm. Yes, ma. This oral order you said was given to mm-hmm. you. Did it mm-hmm. clearly state the nature of the operations that was supposed to take place on the 10th of April 2000? Yes, ma. It 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 entails it entails you know all those I mean those things for the operation you know I mean to be and then. And then moreover, uh, moreover again, the following day, you know, when he called me back, when he called again for a second time. My apologies for calling, uh, for cutting you here. Okay. I just want to go through the list that you had provided for me earlier. So we'll go step mm-hmm. by step. We'll eventually reach where you want us to go. Okay, ma. <laughs> Secondly, the order you received from Mr. Sao, did it state the number mm-hmm. of men you were supposed to take for the operation? Uh, no, he just he just said, you know, I mean, get your standby, you know, your standby unit ready. Because um, one thing, I mean, we um, I need to clarify, uh, uh, we cannot have a specific number for a particular, you know, operation because we don't uh, deal with a lot of operations or the duties apart from you know this uh, specific you know operation i have said so you cannot have a specific number what i used to have is a standby unit which which is about um, uh, not more than 30 and even that standby unit sometimes you can have some people who might absent for for either they they are sick or they have you know emergencies so you can you cannot have a specific number yeah okay We'll go through this list and we'll go through the list of the operational order that was tendered before the Commission of Inquiry. Now, going through your own list mm-hmm. that you've given, the order you received from mm-hmm. Mr. Sao, did it state what is expected of you and your men on the 10th of April 2000? Exactly. Exactly, Ma. My expectation was um, uh, to, maintain, to maintain order. Yes. My expectation was to maintain order, and if there is a demonstration that is disturbing the public order, let me make sure that you know. I mean, the order is maintained. That was specifically, am... you know, said to me. My apologies again, uh, but you didn't answer my question. My co- correction was not about your own expectation. Oh, okay. My correction was about the expectations of the order that was transmitted to you, the oral order from Mr. Sao. Did it clearly state what was expected of oh, you and mm-hmm. your men on that day? Yes, yes, it was. Uh, that's that's what I'm saying. It was uh, the expectation where to to maintain law and order. To, that was the expectation with regards you know, to that demonstration. From what he said, you understood your mission as to maintain law and order, right? Exactly, ma. Exactly. And did this operational order provide how this is supposed to be achieved? Uh, no. No, ma. I don't, uh, I don't have, uh, I don't have anything, you know, I mean, to be achieved. But then, however, our achievement was not to allow the the public order to be disturbed. That was that was our aim. That was, that was supposed to be our achievement. There is a difference between what is supposed to be your achievement and what is clearly transmitted to you. Mm-hmm. I'm trying yeah, that to, was that was. I'm trying to gauge your understanding of what is transmitted to you from the operations commander. Mm-hmm. Uh, my operations commander uh, uh, told me that there could be a, a demonstration state, you know, by Sudan. Under uh, what what I am supposed, you know, I mean, to do is to go on the ground and maintain, you know, the law and order, you know, on the ground. So the expectation, you know, from him, from the order who he gave me, is to make sure that law and order is being maintained 
that you know nothing is disrupting you know the hello nothing is disrupting the normal activities of uh, of other or other people okay hello yes uh, yeah, okay. we can hear yeah. you loud and clear even if you're not seeing us okay. we can still proceed okay so yeah mm -hmm. the order you received from mr sao did it state anything mm -hmm. about the use of force no no i was not uh, i was not i was not asked to use force i was not well is it is that not odd on its own given that you're not even told how you're supposed to do or how you're supposed to carry out your operations actually ma um um as 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 officer commanding or as a police officer if an order is given to you by your superior um he can go back like if you are at the training school that you should do a b c d and and so forth but you I as the right. as the has, okay S sorry to cut you again however yeah. if mm -hmm. you are not clear as to how to go about that particular order aren't you supposed to confirm from your superior how you're supposed to carry out carry out your order very correct very correct very correct that is that is in the event in the event i have doubt or in the event i don't have you know the manpower or in the i don't probably have you know i mean the the logistics you know supplies the means the equipment that i'm supposed to have to carry out that order then i will be i'll be in a position you know to 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 ask him how am i going to carry out you know this operation that's very true in some cases i i, I did going back to security forces in general even mm -hmm. the slightest thing as whether to use force or not am i correct to say that mm -hmm. you're supposed to get instructions as to how to go about it from your superior right yes if you are to use force you know you have to get instructions to be told how to go about it use force you know without any any instruction any order that's very correct and the amount of force also need to be defined by your superior right um, it could be defined by my superior but then i know it also because as a trained you know i mean officer i should know the amount of force that i should use for instance to to a child who is coming to me when i feel that you know i'm uh, you know i'm i'm being attacked or, or an adult who for example come with a stick or a knife i should know the amount of force that i should use to defend myself or to defend you know the part that is under under my under my security that that being as, as an officer you should know that when it comes to force is it not the responsibility mm -hmm. of the superior to determine the gravity of force that needs to be used at a particular operation yes the superior has you know the authority to determine the use of force to be used for a particular operation but if you are on the as you know the commanding officer you use your initiative because by then your your superior might not be there he might be in the office or somewhere else now it's you as the officer commanding or the one in charge of that operation to use your discretion relative to know whether this you need to use force you know because you've been taught what you use so you're telling us that it is the discretion of the commanding officer to determine the force that is to be used in an operation regardless of an if, instruction if or an order received from his superiors no no, no point of point of correction um, uh, you can be given an instruction with regard to the amount of force that you are supposed to use for a particular operation however however if you are on the ground because situations you know deteriorate situation changes you know from one state you know i mean to while you are on the ground, superior is not on the ground you you are to use your initiative to know what level of force that you need to use for this you know particular i mean event that is exactly in front of you but that doesn't mean that 
that doesn't mean that you know you should disregard you know i mean what is what is given what is uh, the force that is given to you because you that one has to be okay um let's say in the case of um use of a weapon for example a gun mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if you are not authorized by your superior to use a gun mm -hmm. can mm -hmm. you use your discretion to do so never 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 mom because the use of force that that one is called even deadly force it's going to be a deadly force the use of deadly force has to come whatever you know i mean the case whatever the situation has to come you know i mean to your superior it should be you know an order if any of you know the police officer or security officer use force uh, at his or her discretion, discretion without you know the, his superior or her superior then that person you know, I mean, needs needs to be to to be punished or answer you know for for that question so it can't it can happen it shouldn't happen like i told you earlier mm -hmm. an operational order was in fact mm -hmm. issued and it was tendered before mm -hmm. the commission of mm -hmm. inquiry into the disturbance of april 10 and 11. So I'm reading right. from mm -hmm. the report itself at page 263 mm -hmm. of yes, the report of the Commission of Inquiry. And right. the title mm -hmm. of the document that is attached to it is the General and Ad Administrative mm -hmm. Instructions from for Operation Student Watch commencing Friday, 7th April 2000. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, on the seventh, on uh, the second page of it, paragraph B, mm -hmm. it provides mm -hmm. that Carnivin Division, mm -hmm. three mm -hmm. platoon of m twenty men, each to be headed by mm -hmm. ASP Momodu Sise and ASP mm -hmm. Modugay. They are to mm -hmm. be based at the PIU headquarters and the divisional headquarters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are you aware of this? No, I'm not aware of that. I I have my platoon that was based in Kanifin, you know, with with me. But I don't because what happened is Kanifin Division is a is an institution is a unit of its own under half an officer command, which is ASP Momodukay. I agree with that. And the police intervention is another unit of its own, which was based in uh, Kanifin. As the officer commanding who is myself you know speaking to you so we cannot we cannot i mean uh how do you call it conflict of of command when you have two units commanding you know two units at the same time it, it could be conflict of you know i mean i mean command so help us understand this a little bit you were stationed okay, at the piu no. correct yes yeah, now and uh, that's right ASP Modugay, where was he based? He was uh, the Canning Division um, commander, and uh, I think his office was in Sarekwa. Normally, should be in Kerab. I was not in PIU. Myself, I was in PIU. Now, with respect to command and how things worked, can you please help mm -hmm. us understand who was answerable to who? Um, in respect of command, the police intervention unit is directly answerable to me. There is no other officer commanding who can come and command my unit without my knowledge. Likewise, you know, his unit, while he was the officer commanding kind of thing, I can't go and then command, you know, I mean, his unit, you know, without his knowledge, especially, particularly in this particular day when you have, you know, I mean, the this right of these students. Were you answerable to him? No, no, no. I was not answerable to him. We are both, we are both answerable to the commissioner of police, was Babakar. So, I was not answerable to him. So, based on what I've read so far, let me read it again, so that you will get right. it. Right. Said three platoons mm -hmm. of twenty men, each to be headed by ASP Momodusisi and ASP Modugay. Mm -hmm. They are to be based mm -hmm. at the PIU headquarters and the divisional headquarters suggesting mm -hmm. that 
this is defective. Yeah, um, uh, you have mentioned, if I understand, on that operational order two, a platoon of 20 men to be based in uh, PIU headquarters and the divisional headquarters. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Their platoon will stay at the divisional headquarters with this kind of thing, and uh, my platoon will stay at my headquarters with this, with this, uh, with this police intervention unit. That's, that is correct, to, to bring that point of correction. So are you suggesting but then that... It my apologies. Okay. Are you yeah. suggesting that yeah. you have never seen prior to the incident of April 10, or you've never seen it at all? Uh, ma, uh, honestly speaking, I can't. I can't remember. I can't remember. It could be. It could be. Honestly speaking, it's, it's a long time, but I can't remember. I mean, seeing you know that operational order. However, I I received verbal order you know from him. I can't remember receiving that order because all the operational order that I receive, I file them. I'm always filing them. We have, like, the number of men on this operational order. We have three platoons of twenty men, and mm -hmm. you said you had only thirty men on the U. Which is which? No, no, no. No, no, no. I don't have thirty men on the um uh, thirty men on the me. Sorry, I said you mentioned the that you had a standby of thirty men. Exactly. I have them to you now. Let me bring that point of correction. I have three platoons, which is not more than, you know, I mean, 30. One platoon, one platoon is responsible, you know, for for the duties that I have said to you now at the American Embassy, British Embassy, IDP Residence, Ministry of Interior, and so forth. All responsible for that. And uh, a second platoon is a standby, you know, platoon. And the third platoon now is the platoon that is off duties. Like for instance, the platoon, like if platoon one is on duty at these places I have mentioned to you, then the following day, whilst I'm having two platoons at the, at the camp, the following day, they will go off duties and then the standby platoon that was there will take over, you know, from them. So you will see at a time, at a particular time, I'll have one platoon in the compound at the PIU, one platoon that is off duties, and another platoon, you know, that is on duty. However, however, if in the case of, you know, I have emergency and I'm told, you know, to bring enough, you know, men on the ground, which I did, then I will call on those who are off duties, you know, to come over and reinforce, you know, the standby platoon that was there. So Based subsequently, you will have basically two platoons. Thank you. Based on this operational order, it sort of like required you to use all the men under your control, including the ones that were on duties. Am I correct? Yeah, right, right. In, in this one, yes, because I mean, uh, I, I was, I was, uh, I was bound to use even those men, you know, who were off duties, and uh, I, I called them, you know, I mean, to come over. That's right. Did you, in fact, use all the men that were on under your control on that particular day? No, I could I could not use all of them. As as I said to you earlier on, some men, you know, could be sick. Others could have emergencies. Others could have. Uh, it depends on private things that you know they were doing at that particular time. So what happened is I will I will get as much as those who were on off you know to reinforce you know the one that are on standby. So not all of them were used. So how many men did you actually use for the operations of April 10? Uh yeah, that that uh, let me see. Um not more than 50, yeah? not more than 50, more, because if I have the platoon that, that is on standby 30 and probably uh, another 10, 15 from the others, you know, at least, at least I can, I could have, you know, another, another 15 or 20 from there. So it's not more than 50 that I have on that very day. And Whereas where... the other platoon is already, you know, deployed. Yes, yes. My apologies again. And where mm -hmm. do the others normally yeah. emanate from? Where do they actually come from? Who or writes the order and distributes them? 
the order for you to, to to work for, for my men to come on duty or no the orders i'm talking about the operational orders where do they emanate from normally no no operational orders normally comes from the police headquarters normally comes from the police headquarters because that's where it should come from the commission of cooperation however sometimes I may ask, I may ask for write an operational order, depending on the operation, and then I will take that operational order and then send it, you know, to the police headquarters for the commissioners review to check it whether it's okay, and then it will be endorsed. Effectively, there is a disconnect with respect to the order given from the operational order and what you had in reality, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You had about Hello? 30 men on standby, as, as you had indicated to us, correct? Yeah, about, yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that is every day. That is every day I have, you know, at, at least uh, I have about 30 men on standby. And this operational order we have here required you to use at least 60 men, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, where would the twenty men have come from? Um, this is what I have explained to you, Ma. Let me go back again to to what is uh, what I have said. Uh, hello. Are you with me? Yes, I am. Actually. Hello. Are you with me? Yes. My apologies. Uh, I zoomed uh, out a okay, bit. Okay, yeah. Okay. Let me let, let me yeah, exactly because I saw the image was you know freeze. I'll go back to what I have said again. I have three platoons. Three. And the one platoon is for um uh, these duties I have told you, American embassy, I just residence and all the places. That those those that platoon is for that. I will be left you know with two platoons. Out of platoons, I have one that is off duty, and then one which is active duties, which is you know in the in the camp. And these two platoons, that's how they rotate. Whilst one is on, another one is you know doing other duties, another one is off duties. So the very day of this you know April 10, I was having one platoon in the camp, which was already there. The two other platoons, one was of duties and the another one was at the at various you know duties I have mentioned earlier. So to substitute, you know, the number of you know men that, that is requested as per the operational order, you know, you are reading now in front of you, I have to call the ones that were on off duties. That is that is our standards. If 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 you are off duties and then we need you know to come for one reason or the other, you will. So that's when you know I call those people, and as I stated, I could not have the whole number of you know people that I wanted. For one reason or the other, they might be sick, they might have emergencies, they might have uh, private issues to do. But then what I have is around fifty, not not more than that. Did you at From any the point duties under the one who were on standby? Did you at any point recall any of your men to join you? Yeah. Yeah, the one I recall were, were those on, on off duties. Those are the only one I call. The one who were on guard, on respective, you know, statics guard, I don't touch that because those were sensitive areas. You cannot call those people in any circumstances. You should not call them. So I did not. I only call those who were off duties. You've told us that you were called at night on the 9th of April 2000, correct? Yes, ma'am. So can you please help us yeah. understand how you had enough time to call your men to actually join you? Right. Right, Ma. Um, uh, you know, my men are regrouped, you know, in the camp. And all of them, all of them, you know, you know in that camp. It kind of in PIU. And then the rest of the men who were not being able, you know, to be residents, you know, in PIU, stayed in uh, Babun Fati, Yuswan. That's where they are given residence. So whenever, you know, these emergencies, you know, I mean, occur or happen, easily, you know, you can get all of them, you know, to come over. The one on staff are there because they know that they are on duty. Now, the one on off duty, these are the ones that now you, you will go, you know, to the residence where, we, where they stay and where we work. 
and then you go to Babul Fati and the call you know those people to, to come over. So that's what's you know helped me. I mean to get all those people you know to come and uh, and help you know in this operation. That's how I gathered them. At what stage did you make the call? Immediately, I received the call from the operational officer, the commissioner of operation. Immediately, I received the call. Immediately, you know, I called, you know, my point of contact, you know, my RSM and uh, my my uh, my clerk to make sure that let them inform all, you know, the standby, you know, I mean, to stay fast, to be at the camp. And the rest of the people, you know, who were off duty, some of them, they were staying, you know, in Kanifi because we all stay together. Others were staying in Babun Fati, and I sent, you know, my RSM to go and uh, inform them of what is next is going to happen. So the same evening, I, I, I did so. Well, do you realize that um, the statement you provided us, which you did not indicate that you actually called some of your men that were not on duty to join you? Yeah, I did not. I did not state it there. Actually, um, if I want to state ev everything, every single thing, then then I can do it. But then this is how I I call. You know, I mean my men, because I mean a PIU. They, I mean, is a is an intervention unit, and uh, what they are told is that any time, any given moment of the day, of the night, you know, you would you should you could be called. You know, for for duties for an emergency. So that way we have it. And it has been happening since, you know, the police intervention was created. Not even this one, but even in emergency, you can get all your I mean, unit, you know, within, within, within hours. And you also realize that this is an important element in determining the number of men that you are gathered that particular day mm -hmm. with respect to your evidence. Yeah, it could be. It, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's important. It's important to know the number of men that, that were gathered, you know, for that very day. I agree, you know, I mean, with you. So this is why I'm testifying and I'm giving you the number of men that I had and how I got them, you know, for this operation. That's very right. And also stated in your statement that you said mm -hmm. I had, I asked Corporal Corps to ascertain and unveil the list of personnel on duty and those on standby to the RSM, who in turn informed them, that is the personnel, of the possible mission on the following day, mm -hmm. April 10th. So those who right. were off duty were not even mentioned, correct? Of course, ma. Of course, what I what I have said, you know, I say that you know, I mean, let him make uh, let him make you know the list of you know people available who were who were on standby, and uh, and I get you know, I mean, other people to you know who were on standby, you know, I mean, to come over. That's very correct. In fact, even when you started your evidence with respect to how you guarded your men, you did not even mention the fact that you had recalled those people that were off duty. And in your statement as well, it's the same thing. So it's like this is an addition into your evidence, correct? Uh, no, not an addition to my evidence, Ma. Um, um, uh, um, I think I have even spoken few things that I have not put you know, in my evidence. I, I think so, since we start, you know, I mean, discussing. So, I mean, uh, what I'm telling you now is, the, is a supplement of you know what is you know in my statement okay, so i'm um, having me that i knew that i was supposed to give the exact number how i got my name I, I will do so i will, I will do so but then i on. think you know this interview is for me to supplement what i have said. yeah i'll i'll leave this point and move on and yeah. leave the commissioners to actually deduce from your evidence now going back to the operational order that we have that was right. submitted before right, the commission I have on point seven, which provides the discretions and the initiatives. Can you tell us what the discretions were with respect to this particular operation you were supposed to embark on? You mean my discretion under my own initiative with regards to this uh, operation? 
what discretions were you told to exercise with respect to the operation? Um, I, 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 I said it again, uh, which I'm, I'm going to elaborate again. I said, I mean, uh, what um, our discretion was to, 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 maintain, to maintain public order in general. And in maintaining, you know, I mean, public order as a police officer at this school, you were taught, you know, so many things, you know, that you should do. And the one, as I said, you know, to protect life and property. Two, to arrest and detain, you know, I mean, suspect. Three, you know, I mean, to, to prepare case file and submit the case file, you know, I mean, to the prosecution office, you know, I mean, for before, before, a, before a magistrate, after their review. And that is how, you know, it goes. Um, sorry, Mr. So Nye, you, you, you have, you have been, you. I mean, a list of... I apologize for taking you back. You're speaking really fast, so it's very difficult for me to catch up. If you can take it a bit slowly and oh. state your point. Um, okay. I stopped at um, arrest and okay. detention. Okay. Then proceed with the rest, please. Yeah, yeah, I said, um, yeah, I said, uh, I mean, in maintaining order, I mean, uh, you were taught so many things, you know, at the police you know, training school, which are the basic things that you are supposed to, to learn. That is arrest, arrest and, arrest and detain. Uh, Mr. Nyai, uh, my apologies. My question was, what were uh -huh. the discretions mm -hmm. that you were told to exercise for that particular operation, not what you were taught in uh, school, training school? Yeah, this, this is what I'm saying. It is what I'm saying. What I was, um, in fact, I, I have given you, that is to maintain public order, to maintain law and order. In maintaining that law and order, I mean, you have to go through all these things as, you know, you are witnessing, you know, I mean, scenes or crime, you know, on during the operations. So, and that during that time, you can, you, your first, your first thing to do is to protect life and property. And okay. if you see suspects, you arrest them and detain them. And they take them, you know, I mean, to... My apologies again. Um, just to go by what you're saying, are you suggesting that you implied mm -hmm. that you should exercise these discretions and you were not actually told what discretions to exercise? But impliedly, from your training, you believe that your discretion was to maintain law and order and to effect arrest when necessary. Am I cor correct in saying all this? No, no, no point, of, point, of, point of correction, no, point of correction on, on that. I'm giving an order that like, for instance, go and arrest this person. I need you to arrest the person. Let's say this, be, this is the instruction. It's given to me but the person, my superior, who has given me, you know, that order is not there. But if I go on the ground to arrest that person, sometimes situation, you know, may change. Probably the person may be cooperate, I mean, may cooperate with me. And then I'll arrest the person and, uh, and, uh, and bring him or her. But then if the person doesn't cooperate, then I will use certain, probably certain uh, physical contact to get, to get the person. Now, in this case, what the operational officer or uh, the operational order said go under maintain order at gtti okay i'm trying to understand you yeah. here because you're not actually answering my question my question is mm -hmm. what discretions mm -hmm. were you told to exercise it's for you to say whether you were told to exercise any discretions or not i am not asking if you okay. Like, okay, I was with not, respect to your training and not, background, I was, I'm right, asking right. I was with not, respect now to I, the order you are given. I got the question. Now I got the question. I was not asked not to use force. I was not asked at any time to use force. Repeat that, please. I said I was not asked any time, you know, to use force or a deadly force. I was okay. not. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um. You know, I did tell you about the operational order we have in front of us from the Commission of Inquiry into the disturbance of April 10 and 11. So I'll read from the mm -hmm. discretion written 
mm-hmm. on the other. During right, the ma. execution of our lawful duties, commanders are required to be as discreet as possible and use only that necessary force required for handling any situation. All members of the force are reminded that they should be courteous, open, neutral, tact, and approachable. Duties are to be carried out in accordance with the law and stand to protect life and property in the best possible and discreet manner. Correct. So from this... I totally agree with that. Yes, from this um, operational order I'm reading, force mm-hmm. was actually allowed, correct? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So from the operational mm-hmm. order, you were indeed mm-hmm. authorized to use force. Yes, force could be, but what kind of force? Is it physical force or deadly force? Well, if it's you say not force for was allowed, answer- yes. Sorry, it's not for me to ah, answer okay. that question. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay, okay, force was allowed. Yeah, you're yeah. the one giving your evi- evidence. Mm-hmm. I'm merely guiding you. Okay, so okay. You... No, I thought I was trying to um, how would I say to clarify you know the issue. The force was allowed to use. But the you just told us that you're not to allowed to use force. Yeah, but ma, when I said force is not allowed to be used. Is because you have level of forces that you can use. And I give you, you know, an example. If you go just to arrest you know, somebody and they come, somebody who's, who's cooperating with you, you will arrest the person. There is no physical force. But if the person resists, obviously there will be a contact. You will use a force you know, to arrest another you know, person and bring you know, to the person where he is supposed to be. So force is always used you know, in the execution of our duties. Thank you for that. We were, I was actually leading towards a practical situation, not actually what is exactly. stated in a, in, a, in a book, a hypothetical situation. Okay. So we'll move on to that. So yeah. the operational order, as we see, provided that force is actually allowed. Yes, force is allowed. It's required uh, depending on the... You did mention to us just a minute ago that you mm-hmm. were not actually allowed to use force. No, ma, when you ask me, when you ask me, under this example I just give you, I mean, minutes ago, that's the same thing, you know, I told you, that, you know, if you go on the ground, even if you are allowed to use force, okay, let me say, yes, I was not allowed to use force, but if I go on the ground, and I, I encounter resistance, so obviously, force is going to be used there, if I said I don't use force, I may be lying, so which force is it now? Is it physical? Is it deadly? Or is it something else? You have to. Force okay. has to be used. Okay, Even if you are not in the operational order. Um, yeah. Mr. Njai, I'm just trying to as uh, I'm mm-hmm. just trying to verify whether there was a disconnect mm-hmm. between the operational order mm-hmm. and what you yeah. actually asked to do. Okay. And what you told us right now. Yeah, that's what I told you right now. Because an you just, order, yes, you have just told us order. right now. Please just listen to the question. Don't be in a hurry. We have a long way to go okay. as it is. Yeah. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. You have just told us that you were not allowed to use force. Not so. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You did told us that you are not allowed to use force, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, the operational order that I've just read to you right now, the one that was submitted before the commission, mm-hmm. and the one mm-hmm. that has the signature mm-hmm. of the commissioner of operations, that is Mr. Saul, mm-hmm. clearly mm-hmm. indicates that you mm-hmm. are allowed to use the necessary force required, speaking directly from Mm-hmm. Speaking directly from the language of the text, you are required mm-hmm. to use the necessary force. So mm-hmm. clearly, force was permitted as mm-hmm. per this operational order. Mm-hmm. So I just need to know, what was your understanding of the discretion you were allowed to carry out on that particular day? Um, 
Now I told you at the first place that you know I receive you know a detailed operational order that you are reading to me now before me which you have before on, uh, in, on your table. I was in that operational order. I could not remember having it. Let me use that word. But what I could remember is that I was told you know to go and uh, disperse you know some students by maintaining um, uh, uh, law and order. Now, um, if now I'm I'm informed, I'm being informed that I can use necessary force that is required, you know, to, to do my operational duties, then I will take it as that. But then I don't receive any any operational order. I could not remember receiving detailed operational order, you know, like that. I could not. So basically you're telling us that you're hearing this for the first time. No, 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 this is not for the first time I'm hearing these things. I, I hear these things many times, you know, when I'm, I'm, I'm carrying out operations. I'm talking about this particular operational times. order, Mr. Guy. Using your necessary force. Yes, I'm talking about the operational order yes. that this was supposed to guide your operations. Mm -hmm. And what I've read to you so far, mm -hmm. was this the first time that you've heard of it? Mm -hmm. Um, you can say, yeah, mm -hmm, but the record yeah, will not fight for Because as I said, I don't, this is my first time. Oh yeah, I said, this is my first time, you know, to hear that. But you are reading, you know, to me. Because I don't remember having a physical document of such detailing what and what, you know, I'm supposed, you know, I mean, to do. Um, this is what I have said. Mr. Njai? This was a major yes, operations that you were supposed to embark on. Was it not a fundamental right, error for you to embark on such operations without receiving any mm -hmm. written order that clearly provides mm -hmm. a guideline as to how you should go about that particular operation? I agree with that. I agree with that. I totally agree with you. Okay. I then. totally agree with you. Mm -hmm. So you agree with me that it was a fundamental failure on your part not to I, inquire more about what you were supposed to do on that particular day? I agree with you. Exactly, I agree with you. I will not dispute on that. And you will also agree that it is also a failure on the part of the police administration for failing to deliver an operational order that will guide your operations on that particular day. I agree with that, Ma. I agree with that. Fair enough. So this tells us that from the beginning of that particular operation, there was a clear disconnect from your unit and the orders you received from the top, correct? Um, it yes yeah there could be a, a connection as as per the operational orders you are reading which is detailing specifically you know what you are required you know i mean to do i would say yes there could be some instance of disconnection i agree um it's either there was or there was not not a could be so there was a disconnect between what you understood and what was being transmitted to you correct yeah, I will not, no, my point of, I would not say um, uh, it was, there was a disconnection because I, I received a call, a, a verbal, you know, instruction stating me what I'm supposed to do and the nature of the operation that I'm supposed to do as well. So if I say totally it's disconnection, then uh, I may not tell the truth. But then I again, the truth. you did not actually even know the content of this operational order. You're even surprised by the necessary use of force that I just told you. Yeah, I don't know the content of the operational order. I'm just referring to the, I mean, verbal instruction, verbal message, telephone calls I received you know, from the operational, I mean, officer, I mean, commissioner. Not what is what is written, what, what you are having now presently on your table. I'm not talking about that. So clearly there w you were misinformed. There was a disconnect between you and operations, right? Yes. Yes, ma'am.
operational order also did not provide for arrest and detention. And clearly, there were several arrests and detention on the 10th of April 2000. Correct? I totally agree with you. That an and operational order is, is not detailing all what you are supposed to do on the ground, Ma. And I have, gave, I have given you examples. Okay, um, uh, you um, can go on the ground just to just pass, but then... My apologies. Let's okay. just move on okay. from there because okay. we are dwelling okay. on this issue too much. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, I believe uh, we've exhausted the time allocated for a session. So this will be a convenient time to go on a break and come back. Um, Mark, oh, can I, I come in? Uh, Hello? All right with me. So My apologies. We have already exhausted the time allocated to us. You can keep that point, but then again, go on with your point. Yeah. Um, uh, because of my professional engagement, uh, if I am, you know, to go and I come back again, you know, I may have, you know, some some other things, you know, that I'm doing. So I'm appealing with the members of the commission if we can carry out and finish it once and for all. Because I mean, to be frank with you, I'm, I'm, I'm given an allocated time. And uh, if yes, I will go and come back. And uh, now we are three hours ahead of the Gambia. I, I may not, maybe, I probably may not be able, you know, I mean, to continue. That's what I'm appealing. Okay, then allow me to um, seek the consent of the chairman yes. for us to proceed. Yeah, yes. yes. Mr. Yeah. Chairman? Council, actually, we were in your hands. Emma. So whatever logistics you worked out with them, we are in your hands. But I'm ready to go until 5 o'clock in the evening. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. We'll proceed uh, so that also we can hear another witness later in the day. So we proceed with it. Thank you. Fine. That's all right with me. Thank you, Mr. But uh, if we have... Uh, uh, since I have the floor now, if you can make, just want to uh, counsel to be uh, aware of what I'm trying to say. If we uh, continue, I believe the witness is Mr. Momodu Sise. Yes. Counsel has been saying, uh, Mr. Njai, Mr. Njai, I want to be sure that uh, the record is correct, that uh, for this morning session, yes. your references to Mr. Njai He's called Sisenjai. <laughs> He's called Sisenjai, so. Oh, oh, yeah, we have so many names here in Gambia. Those ones with okay. the two last names. Sisenjai, sorry. My apologies then. Thank you. You may proceed. Very Thank well, you. very well, very well. No, no, I mean, Mr. <laughs> Go on. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, you, you are correct. You are right. He says we're only time saying Mr. Ndiaye, Mr. Ndiaye. And I would rather prefer, you know, the Mr. Sise, because uh, I, I have signed a document which I put, you know, Momodu Sise. I totally agree with you. My, I'm commonly called Sise, but let's call, let's, let, let's have call me Mr. Sise, if possible. Oh. <laughs> my apologies, but you can understand my confusion when I see Sise Ndiaye. No. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll try from now on to call you Mr. Cesar, but if I go astray, just help me out here. Because no I'm already problem. used to this no guy. Problem. No problem. Okay, so we have agreed that there was a disconnect in communication between your unit and that of operations, right? Right. Right, Ma. So... In effect, you were operating under orders that were not even clear, correct? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, ma, I, 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 I agree with you. So, Since you I don't have an operational order with me detailing what I'm supposed to do, I agree. Mm -hmm. When you received... Um, this information from Mr. So, what did you do?
right um when i received this information you know from mr so knowing the uh, the nature of uh, the uh, the disturbance uh, and the way it's going to be where it's going to take place and uh, what he has uh, informed me i i started mobilizing you know i mean the units i started mobilizing the unit and uh, i said earlier on that uh, i have a standby unit that is uh, that is on the ground and then those who are of duties you know also we we call them to come and reinforce the standby units that's what i did and wait you know for the next you know instruction okay you've told us that you received um this mm -hmm. instruction from mr so on the ninth. when did you start mobilizing your right unit? right that's that i said it immediately after that i've called you know the units rsm and then the clerk and uh, i told him please uh make sure you inform the standby unit to be prepared you know we have an operation meanwhile you can also check you know the list of those who are off duties you know to reinforce you know the standby unit that's what i did the same the same night the same evening i did so can you please take us through what you did in preparation of the others that you were supposed to carry out just give us a narrative from that night to the morning of right. the tent right um uh, that that evening i i am not staying in the camp you know i stay outside the camp and uh, when i received you know the information i i made an i made a call before going to the camp for the rsm to to make sure that they make the list ready and I get, you know, I mean, all those who were on standby, you know, to, those who were of duties also to be, to be ready. So I came to the camp that evening and then uh, start asking my RSM and my clerk whether all the men have been informed. And the answer was yes. This person was already there and some of the were of duties have been informed and the tomorrow morning, as early as 6 or 6 30 you know everybody you know will be on the ground that was my, my problem then the following day hello go on are you me hello okay then the following day which is uh which is april april 10th already around around 6 30 i was already in the camp and upon my arrival uh all the men were assembled were gathered with their equipments and those equipments as i mentioned earlier on they have you know their helmets they have their seals they have their buttons they have you know i mean the um uh, uh, how to call it the mask the gas mask you know and that they have also their tear gases and then a pa system so this is what they were having. Upon my arrival, I start I started having briefing with them because obviously, uh, before you take your men under your command to a particular operation, you need to you need to brief them. You need to tell them what is what they are supposed to do. You need to tell them where the operation is going to take place. You need to also check in turn whether they have any question or any doubt that may ask you know that they may ask you and at the same time you also ask the officer commander or the the commander of the unit to check each and every equipment whether it's ready whether they are intact and so forth so all these things i did it you know in that in that morning when i arrived so now, what essentially did you tell the men when you arrived during the briefing what exactly did you tell right them? right um i told them that uh, we we have an a, a mission an operation you know to carry out and that this is what i have received you know from from video that we have some students who are going to stage you know a demonstration a probable demonstration because it was not you know sure whether they will do it or not and then our duties when we arrive on the ground it's going to be to maintain 
law and order. And the old those command has to come, you know, I mean, from me. All your movements, all what you're supposed to do has to come, you know, from me with the assistance of my RSM. And I get all your equipments, ranging from what I have told you now. This right here, you know, equipment ready. And then you wait for the next, you know, instructor. Whilst I was, I mean, whilst I was giving them this briefing, then I received a call from the Commissioner of Operation that, yes, I can deploy, you know, my men. He asked me first, do you have your standby? Are they intact? Because he should do that too. Are they okay? Everything is okay. I say yes. All of them are here with their equipment and that they are all okay. Then he asked me to deploy now, you know, to GTI. I just want to seek a few clarification for what you, from what you've told us already. At what mm -hmm. time of the day did you arrive at the office? Around 6.30. I was already in the office. So by the time I took, you know, that briefing of Sorry, 10, you know, can you minutes, read the time? I, I said around, around 6.30, 0630 hours. You've told us that if, even before your arrival, your men had already taken up all their equipment, correct? Yes, that's correct. That's what we normally do. I mean, uh, before my arrival for any operation, they are prepared. They are ready and they are on the ground and they wait for the next instruction. I found them they were already, they already assembled. Can you please Looking tell us me. what equipment your men were carrying when you arrived? Okay, I will repeat it again, Ma. I told you they carried, you know, I mean, uh, individual seals, helmets, button, uh, um, uh, smoke mask, tear glasses, and then a PAS that was supposed, you know, to be, you know, for me. That was supposed to be handed over to me, a, a personal a public address system. You did not mention the use of any gun. Did no, you? no, I did not. Uh, I did not. Uh, oh, sorry. We have also um, a, a tear gas gun. Tear gas gun. Yeah. Tear gas gun. Yeah. Were there any other weapons apart from the ones you've listed that your men had in their possession? No. There were there were there was no no other gun apart from this one I have listed. My dad, I'm just hearing myself speak <laughs> over again. Oh, okay. yeah. You can go ahead and answer the question. Yeah, I said apart from the equipment that I have listed now. There was no other, you know, specific or particular gun, you know, with, with the units. So, as far as you can recall, you're telling that the PIU had no guns in their position that morning? No, no gun in their position in, at, at that morning. However, however, we need to, we need to clarify this point. Um, I have all the PIU personnel in all the respective duty, I mean, areas, who are armed. And can you tell us the... Before we proceed, I want to, I want to make it clear. Um, let's just get this clear a little bit, please. Because you've told us that even before your arrival, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the men were already gathered, waiting for you, mm -hmm. correct? Yes, ma'am. That's correct. That's very correct. Mm -hmm. Yes, and this comprised of those who were on That's standby and those who were off duty, correct? Mm -hmm. So who were those... Correct, ma. That's correct. So who were those that um, had guns in their possession? Those are the ones 
who are not in the camp are the ones that we have posted at the american embassy british embassy Ministry of Interiors, the IDP, Supreme Court, and so forth. But then the unit that was supposed, you know, to go for this particular, you know, operation at GTTI, the what I have listed, what I have told you now, this is what you know they they all have. As far as you can recall, you did not send out word to recall those people that were on duty in their respective posts, correct? No, no, never. They so should not. And if anybody, you know, don't go, you are to be, you, you are, you are to be answered for it. No, there so was no other were not, you know, to leave. Those people were not aware of what was going on at the PIU headquarters, correct? Um, they might know. They might know through their to through colleagues, through mates, you know, because if. You know, we are all it's the same units. And, uh, and uh, as a unit, when there is an information, you need to, you need for all your, all, the, all your men to know about it. That is, that is, that is a habit. You need them to know what is, what is happening because they are security officers. They might know what was going to happen probably. You've just told us that you only inform, yeah. you only ask that the people on standby be informed and the ones that were off duty as well. Those are the only two categories yeah. that you told us that were gathered on that particular day in the morning, correct? That, that's right. That's what they correct. Those are the ones who are going to be assigned for these particular duties, not any other person. That's right. And that was about 50 men, correct? Oh, yeah, about 50, yeah. And those that were in their various position, manning the various embassies and offices, were not included in the 50 you just told us, right? No, they were not. They were not included. I just want to mention, I mention it just to let you know that I also have another set who are armed because I want to bring all, you know, all the lights. I want to see, no, I mean, all the lights, not on what I'm telling you now. But then again, they were on duty and yeah, they, they had duty. work to do and as right. far as um security is concerned they were not supposed to leave their duty post and do some other thing that you did not instruct them to do correct very very correct ma very very correct yep so we'll limit it to the number of people you actually called for this particular operation okay that's very correct ma. very correct yeah we limit it to that yeah so on that particular day, you had 50 men gathered, correct? Yes, ma, about 50 men gathered, yes, ma, correct. And all those 50 men, you are telling us right now that none of them carried a gun. None of them, you know, carried a gun because, all right, that point. As I said at the beginning, anybody who is going to be given a gun is with my knowledge. And the person, you know, has to sign in, you know, a register. The weapon that is a serial number there, the number of ammunition has to be there under what type of duty, you know, he's going to he's going to carry out also, you know, all has to be mentioned. So consequently, subsequently there was nobody nobody who was carrying weapon within that 50 men i told you who were supposed not to come with me none of them otherwise i would have seen it and that the weapon were supposed to be from my from my own instructions so effectively you as the officer in command knew very well what type of weapons that your men were carrying that day that's what you're telling us right and you're exactly, telling us that exactly, they did not carry any guns, right? Exactly, exactly ma'am. That's my responsibility. That's my sole responsibility to know what type of weapon they carry. I don't know what type of weapon was carrying weapon. And you've told us that when you arrived, the men were already gathered, correct? That's right. That's right, ma'am. Did you inspect all of them? That's, that's very correct. 
you know, you cannot go on duties during the briefing. When you when you brief, as I said, that 15 minutes briefing I have, um, the briefing entails inspecting and checking that whether they have all the necessary equipment that they are supposed to do for a particular, you know, duties. And then you even ask them whether they are fit as well. Whether they are fit to do, do to, to carry out the duties. So I have inspected them and ascertained that everything is okay physically, I mean, uh, logistics wise, um, equipment wise, I have done all that. Okay, for how long did yeah. you actually make sure that all of these things are in place? Remember, you've told us that you arrived at the office at 6 30. Now, how long did it yeah, take you to address the men and inspect all their weapons? That, ab about 15 minutes. Because I remember when I arrived in 6.30, as I told you, they were already on the ground. And, uh, and uh, within, within uh, 15, 20 minutes, I, I, I briefed them. And then that's the time I received you know, a call from the operation commander. How about you? Did you carry any weapons? No, myself, I did not. I was not having a weapon. As the officer in command, did you... Mm -hmm. Let me repeat the question again. Did you carry mm -hmm. any weapon with you? As an officer, command, officer commanding, I don't carry any weapon, you know, with me. However, however, um, I could carry a weapon, I could carry a weapon if I'm going for a particular, you know, I mean, duties and I'm authorized you not know, to carry a weapon. Um, um... <laughs> My apologies again, uh, Mr. Cisse, you're not answering my correction. Mm -hmm. My correction is not if you mm -hmm. could have carried a weapon. My correction is, did you in fact mm -hmm. carry a weapon on mm -hmm. that particular day? No, no, I did not carry a weapon on that particular day. I did not, say it. Okay, we'll come to that issue again. Um, you said immediately after you mm -hmm. addressed the men on the operations, you received a call from mm -hmm. the director of operations, Mr. Saul, and well, he asked you to deploy your here. men. Where did he ask you to mm -hmm. deploy your men? Okay. Um, the Commission of Operation, the Commission of Operation Babakar Saul asked me um, to deploy my men at the eye that's where you know we went sorry i didn't get that at where at gtti gtt abia technical training institute golf tango tango india well thank you very much for that um from gtt from your headquarters at the piu to gtti how many minutes is that um, it's roughly depending on on the traffic, you know, you know, GTTI and the police intervention. Is just, you can even stand and uh, see GTTI over there. It's uh, not more than five minutes. Not more than five minutes. So how did you converge? Depending on the traffic because it was a rush hour. How did you converge at GTTI? I went, you know, by, by vehicle. We were having, you know, a, a vehicle, official vehicle, you know, on the horse. And uh, that's what I I used, you know, to convert, you know, my my men, you know, to GTTI. How about, to GTTI. My apologies. How about your men? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. We had a vehicle at the police intervention unit. That's what I used, you know, to transport, to convert, you know, the unit. GTTI, we went by, by, by vehicle. Okay, can you please take us through what happened when you arrived at GTTI? Okay, um, on my arrival at GTTI, um, of course, yes, I arrived, all the men, you know, I mean, this I'm back, you know, from, uh, from the vehicle. And then they assemble on the other side of the road, that is the opposite side where you know the crowd is uh, is standing where you can see the crowd i was on the side of the road going towards banjul and they were on the other side of the road going towards you know Gintex. so when i came i the men i brought them down you know assembled them 
and then I had discretion, my own discretion to go. Because when I arrived, I saw the crowd there at GTKI. I, I could see actually um, uh, not only one, but then you could see one around the main road, another one on the left hand side, and the one inside, you know, GTKI. And at the same time, at that point in time, I, 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 I noticed, you know, soldiers, armed soldiers who came from Fajara Barracks. And those are the Gambia National Guard, you know, soldiers. I could not see, notice them within the vicinity. So I went and approached um, uh, the, um, where they were, I mean, student leaders, but then I know that I approached, you know, some of them. I, I could not identify who was the leader or not. And uh, try to dissolve, you know, the situation to bring it down. So I went approach them and I started talking to them. Um, uh, what is the use of this demonstration that you want to stay? It is better you leave, you know, this place peacefully, go to your respective business, either to school or you go back home. So, okay, so, uh, in the group, I could... Uh, I could have some some murmuring, some answers. Like some of them were saying, no, we won't go. Some of them are saying, no, 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 a sort of. But yet still, I I, I continue pleading them that you know this, you know, they have to they have to leave. They have to leave, you know, I mean this place and go home to disturb, you know, the public order. That was the second time I told them that, but still. They refuse, and apparently they are getting more agitated. So I say, okay, that's fine. So as I was going back to where the unit was standing, the, I mean the, the police intervention on the other side of the road, the opposite side of the road, then you can see how they were getting more and more agitated. Hello? Are you? Okay, yeah. So you, you can see how they were getting more and more agitated. And uh, I could also notice, observe that they were even like uh, coming more now on the highway. And that it was uh, eventually the highway was uh, was like, you know, blocked. So no vehicle was could go. The one coming from Banjul, you know, towards the regular. You can see that the, the traffic was completely blocked. So at that stage with their agitation, I said, okay, what should I do? Then I took, you know, my PA system, the personal address system. Then I talked to them, asking them to leave this place, this pass, you know, this place, and to go home, you know, peacefully. Otherwise, you know, the intervention, the PIU will disperse you. This is what I told them. Four times, almost four times with interval of five minutes. But it seems any time I say so, they get more irritated and they will not come, you know, on the on the highway. So the fourth time when I said so, then I turned, you know, to my unit, to the unit PIU, and then give them a second briefing reminder that this is the situation now we are facing. Um, uh, the crowd is agitated and uh, they are getting more and more on the highway and uh, now we have to disperse them. That was the time I, I told them, you know, to charge and uh, disperse, make sure that, you know, the road is completely clear. Thank you very much. Um, I would just like to ask a few questions to clarify some of the right. issues that you've just stated. Right. You've told us earlier that it was the Commissioner of Operations that called you in the morning to right. act, and he informed you that you should deploy your men at GTTI. Correct? That's right, ma. Yeah, that's right. He's the one who informed me. In the morning mm -hmm. when you arrived at GTTI, did you see the Commissioner of Operations there? No, I did not see the Commissioner of Operations. I think throughout the operations, um, at this event, I did not see him. I did not see him there. As at the time you approached the students, can you tell us mm -hmm. where your men were stationed? 
Um, I said it, my men were still on the other side of the road, the opposite side. You know, the double lane road. They were at DTTI and we were on the other side, completely the other side. That is the, I mean, the, the road going to Banjo. That's where they were. Um, that would be but the cemetery myself, just opposite DTTI, correct? Exactly, exactly. But myself, I crossed over the road and uh, I went where they were standing to talk to them, to approach them. At this point, did you go alone to approach them? Right. Right. I went alone, ma, to approach them because the crowd was not, uh, um, uh, to my assessment, you know, it was not like aggressive. They were not aggressive. So I said, oh, okay, then I can, I took my initiative to go and, uh, and approach them. So at this point, from your own assessment, the crowd was peaceful, correct? Yeah, they were, they were peaceful the time I arrived. If they were peaceful, they were just standing you know, on the side of the road. Sorry. What was the composition of that crowd? Um, I may not know exactly how many of them were in that crowd, but as I stated, um, uh, the bigger no. number was the one... Sorry, you did not understand my questions clearly. My question is, what was the composition of that crowd? How are you, oh, are you able okay. to identify the okay. people that were in the crowd? Okay. okay, okay. The composition of the crowd, yeah, okay. Um, uh, they were composed of, um, I can see some, some children as young as uh, 15 years old, to be honest, to my own, um, uh, to my own assessment. And I can see, I could also see um, some of them who are adults, and a part of them were in uniforms. I can I could recognize the uniform as far as I know, and the others are without uniform. In fact, the the bigger number they were without uniform. The crowd that you saw, were they armed? They were not armed. Um, uh, they were not having. Uh, to be honest with you. They were not even, not even having stones or stick, you know, with them. None of them was armed, to be honest with you. None. So when you approached this crowd of students, they didn't seem to you like a threat, did they? No, they were not a threat to me. This is why I even have the guts, you know, to go to them. And if they were a threat to me, I would have not gone. I, I, I assess that, you know, they were not trying to me. That's why I went to them, up to them. You mentioned that you actually spoke to them. Did you speak yeah. to any mm -hmm. individuals in the crowd individually? Actually, no. No. I did not speak um, in the, um, uh, to any of them individually. As they were standing on the side of the road, then uh, when I approach, of course, the bigger group that was next to the road, without talking of you know the other one and the, I mean the third one that was in DTTI, I, I spoke you know to the to the one that was next to me nearby the road, but not individually. I just addressed them you know uh, collectively. Did that crowd, from the from your own uh, recollection and from what you perceived? Did it look as if a group of individuals were leading that crowd? Yes, yes. So to, to my assessment, I I I have, uh, I could uh, I could uh, see that you know there were individuals leading you know that crowd because they could have not have that that big crowd like that without somebody you know leading them. But I could not know who who was the leader. I could not identify the leaders. From your own assessment of things, the people you speak to, did they appear to be the leaders of that particular crowd? Yes, to my assessment, yes, ma. Yes, ma. I'm the one that I have spoken to. I I consider them. I consider them to be the leader of of, of the crowd. And uh, even if they were not, they were not also leaders. And uh, the way I was talking, I was talking at the top of my voice. Voice. So basically, um, all those who were standing with him, within around there, they they could hear what what I was tell, telling them. Did they say anything to you while you were speaking to them? 
No, I was ignored. <laughs> I was ignored, and then uh, apparently that's uh, uh, that's when I started hearing in the crowd, in the crowd. Some of them say no, we will not move. Some of us, some of them are saying no, we don't, we don't want to listen to him. And there's some murmuring, of course, that I, I can't exactly tell what, uh, what they were saying. From uh, what you've told us, you said you approached them. Did anyone actually approach you to explain to you what their purpose was for gathering there? Unfortunately, no, ma. When I approached them and I talked to them, none of them, none of them definitely um, approached me to, to tell me what, what their purpose is for, for gathering there at GTI. None of them, I did not talk to any of them. I would like to read an extract from one of the witness statements that we have, and it's from uh, mm -hmm. Alaji S. Dabo. Mm -hmm. And I read from paragraph mm -hmm. 22 of his statement. He right. said, on Monday the 10th of April 2000, at about 7.30, remember you provided us with time, so this is exactly within yeah. the time frame that you provided us with. Right. I arrived at GTTI and found the Gamsu president and some executive members by the roadside. Other students mm -hmm. also started arriving. Mm -hmm. About two buses stopped and some students disembarked. We were waiting for the vehicle for the delegation to go to the vice president, Isatunjai Saidi. In less than 30 minutes, the PIU also arrived and, starting, and started calling on students to disperse immediately. You've told us exactly that you told the students to disperse. Not so. Um, um, can, can, I, can I come in on that, on that portion? You may. Okay. <clears throat> um, we did not... I did not uh, come with my men and I told them immediately to disperse. Uh, we don't do that because when you come, you have to assess, you know, I mean, the situation and that's exactly what I did to, through my explanation. When we came, they disembarked and they, they assembled the opposite side of the road, the other side, and then I approached them. I did not tell them to disperse at that point in time. I approached them to plead to them to disperse. Yes, I told them. Please, can you disperse and you leave this area and then you go home? That's yes. So you agree with me that you did tell them to disperse, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I told them that. I went to the first time, my first point of contact with them. I told them. So we that. move on with the statement. Still reading from the same right, paragraph. Right now. I tried right to now. approach him to tell him the development, that there was no demonstration, mm -hmm. but before I could reach them, the officer started advancing. This is one of the students speaking, student leaders, Alaji S. Dabo. Mm -hmm. And he mm -hmm. was the deputy vice president of Gamsu, as it then was. Right. Sorry, vice president. He said he tried to approach you, but then again, your men started advancing towards them. Let me finish up with the statement. I raised my hands up, but they kept advancing until they passed me and started beating and arresting the students, including Omar Juf. The rest of the students ran in different directions through the cemetery, inside GTTI, and towards Westfield End, chased by the PIU <coughs> officers. I was hit on the head once with a truncheon and about to fall down. I managed to get to a tree by the roadside and I leaned on it for a while until I gained consciousness. Is he lying about the scene? Um, I'm not going to say that you know, he is lying because that, uh, that's up to the commission. But then what I can say there is, uh, there is no, no officer commanding or unit commander who will just come on the ground and then start dispersing or, or en having an encounter, you know, with the, with the crowd. No. Definitely no. no. I did not see him. He has never come to me to talk 
to me. If that was the case, it was peaceful, as I said in my in my earlier statement. They were very peaceful, honestly speaking. I have to be frank with you. They are very peaceful. So that was, I have the guts that there was no threats, you know, directed to me. And then I went and I talked to them. I was the one who went and I talked to them. No, he not, didn't. Not, none of them have come to me. Mr. Njai, he didn't say he approached you. He said he tried to approach you. And oh, okay. also, I'll just read an extract from your statement as well. Mm -hmm. If I may. I'm mm -hmm, reading from yeah. paragraph 5, just towards All the right. end. Mm -hmm. After several failed attempts to convince them to disperse, and while I was going mm -hmm. back to where the PIU personnel stationed, the crowd became mm -hmm. more agitated and prevented mm -hmm. the flow of traffic. I then mm -hmm. made the use of the PAS, asking them mm -hmm. to peacefully disperse mm -hmm. and leave. Otherwise, the PIU mm -hmm. personnel will disperse them. Right. These warnings were repeated four times with the interval of five minutes, but I right. still I was facing resistance. At that mm -hmm. spot, I deemed it necessary to let the PIU to disperse the crowd bef before engaging the PIU personnel. Mm -hmm. right. I had a short briefing in reminding them mm -hmm. of our objective which was to maintain public order. Right, ma. Right, ma. That's exactly what I did. Okay. Now you've told mm -hmm. us that at mm -hmm. the point where you when you approached the students, they were all very mm -hmm. peaceful. None of them carried right. a weapon. But they were agitated right. about something. Right? Mm -hmm. And it was mm -hmm. not actually towards you. Mm -hmm. Correct? No, I, I could not determine what they were agitated, you know, what the agitation was I mean, it's from. The, the source of the agitation, I could not know. But I knew that they were agitated. But from your own, but I could not know from your own perception mm -hmm. on that particular day, you've told us that you perceived that they were peaceful. Yeah, they were peaceful. Honestly, they were peaceful, right? And yet, your men did attack mm -hmm. them. Correct? Yeah. Can, you, can, I put a, can I bring a point of correction there or to enlighten you know, that area? Uh, Mr. Njai, your men did attack them. Is either a true or false? And after you can bring your point of clarification. Yes, yes, yes. They, they, yeah, they dispersed them. They dispersed them. Yes, ma'am. I mentioned attack and not disperse. They attacked no. the students. No. Okay. No. Let's go through how they actually disperse the students. Okay. I'll give you a certain I'll give you certain points from the statements of the mm -hmm. students that I had read. Right. One mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. your men started shooting tear gas into the crowd, correct? Without any provocation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Correct? Well, I'm listening. No, I'm listening to you. Do you I am. Do, you know what you are telling actually me? Ask, asking a question. It's for you to affirm. Your men mm -hmm. shot tear gas into the crowd of students without provocation. Correct? Yeah, they shot. Yeah, we we discharged some gases. Yeah, some tear gases. Yeah. The students were then beaten with buttons and shields. Um, correct. I. I I could witness one under uh, yeah. I could witness one. I saw I saw one of them beating a student with button. Yes. But it actually happened during this process, correct? Yeah, during when they when they were dispersed. Yeah, when they were dispersing them, right? The students ran away because right. of the tear gas and the aggression of your men, correct? Right. And your men chased them and beat some of them correct and arrested some of them as well correct um i'll come to that that point but but they they were beaten they were chased uh, and beaten yes mm -hmm. Yai, yes is yes yes, it yes, happened yes or it did not happen so please tell us if it that happened. happened it happened it happened it happened so in fact from all of these things your men actually caused the aggression they attacked the students without any form of provocation correct Ma, 
um, uh, can you give me to uh, let me explain myself because you are just giving me a list of one, two, three, and then you want to want me to say yes or no, yes or no. So at least give me give me the chance, you know. I mean to, to you, tell you. You can answer the, the question. Man, you can choose. You can choose to say it didn't happen and then clarify, and you can choose to say it happened. It is already oh, truth that okay, I'm yeah, looking for. It happened. It happened. Okay, correct? it happened. They chose them, and under some of them were beaten. Yes. Okay, I'll give you time to actually clarify some of these things based on your own okay, recollection. Okay. I am just right. concerned about the truth of what happened that day. Right, now, right ma. Mm -hmm. Now, you will agree that all of these things that happened, mm -hmm. the attacking of students without any form of provocation, the beating and mm -hmm. arresting of students, was all mm -hmm. contrary to the order that was given, correct? No, it was not contrary. They were they they dispersed them. I don't want. I don't like the word attack. You know, me too. I mean, they dispersed them because the word attack is is really um I'm not comfortable with that word. Word definitely. Um, if you pass, I will I will agree with you. But attack them, I I'm not very much comfortable. My apologies for not using the word that you want me to use, but. It's either blue or no, black. Not, not, it cannot be both. Not, not I want you to use. Not I want you to use. You can use whatever words you know you want. But I say that I'm not comfortable, you know, with that word. But you can use it. I'm, I, I, not that I want to tell um, you what you are supposed to use. Mr. Mr. Njai, mm -hmm. uh, let's just go mm -hmm. back to the point here. It's not about the right, use of words. Words, okay, can, words can mean different things. But the point right. is the students were attacked. Correct. Right. Right. Okay, now let's go back to the operational order. And whatever mm -hmm. happened during that time is actually contrary to the operational order we mm -hmm. have here. I read from there. Mm -hmm. right. right. It states, we should avoid provoking disturbance and bear the required level of tolerance to avert any situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Clearly, that did not happen mm -hmm. from your own end. You didn't do that. Would you agree? Mm -hmm, I'm listening. Yes, I'm listening. Yes, ma. Yes. Do you, do you agree with what I've said so far? Yes, yes, ma. Okay. So we'll move on from that. You agreed that mm -hmm. you provoked the attack and then you arrested some of the students who we have identified as the leaders of the demonstration what happened after you you've arrested them um, um ma, i don't agree that you know we provoke you know i mean the attack what what happened of course i agree that uh, i i witnessed some of them were 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 beaten and that is up to the commission you know the to to test i mean to determine that but what why why we dispersed them was that they were blocking you know the traffic um they were I'm completely not, blocking the traffic. I'm not asking. Um, I'm not asking the reason why. I'm just mm -hmm. concerned as to how it was done. And in yeah, this that's, case, that's where I'm coming because yes. I have to give a reason and say why. So this is where I was coming to. Yes, and in this case, uh, you will agree with me that mm -hmm. uh, a bunch of students just gathered at a particular place mm -hmm. without causing mm -hmm. any form of disturbance. Was there was a disturbance, ma. I don't, agree. I, don't, I don't agree with that, ma. They, there was a disturbance because they, the moment, the moment you know they 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 came, they come up you know highway and they block the traffic. There's a disturbance. There's public disorder. So there is, and that was the reason why my unit was trying to disperse them. We cannot, we cannot, we cannot disperse students. Who have not, you know, I mean, uh, created any 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 public disturbance. So that's why I said I don't agree with that. We did not attack them; we just going to attack them. Okay, I did read out the statement of a particular student, and you agreed with right. me that that student was right. Now I'll read out the statement of another student that was on that particular present on that particular scene, and you will tell me whether this statement is actually true as to what happened or not. 
at yeah. 6 30 so, a.m soma can you can you hear me yes sorry yeah because um uh, when you when you read when you read all those i mean um, statements those points i wanted to intervene and actually you told me no say yes or no and then later you know you'll have the chance you know to come in so so this is why i was saying yes if it happened if beating was happened i would say yes if they were chased i would say yes if tear gases were thrown i would say yes but then give me the chance now to come and say why this thing was happened okay then uh, you want to provide yeah. a justification for it correct exactly exactly ma okay exactly. let's hear That's your all justification then okay thank you so much ma um um I will not I will not deny I will not deny at all that they were not chased, they were not dispersed, they were not beaten because I have seen Okay once now, or twice based on where you have started so far, you have told me already that you do not deny all those points that I've mentioned, right? Yeah. Then you, you told you, me that you know they you were not, they were not yes. disturbing. You, you were do not deny the they fact were, that Sorry, let me repeat it again. You do not deny the fact that the students were peaceful at that point, correct? Mm -hmm. You do not deny mm -hmm. the yeah, fact right. that they right. were not acting provocatively towards your men, correct? Right. You do not right. deny the fact that it was your men that shot at them with mm -hmm. tear gas right. and right. chased them, beating them with batons. Right, ma. And right, later ma. arrested some of them correct that, that's very correct and that's that very is correct, clearly the fact of whatever happened that day isn't it yeah that is correct yeah that is it's so, a real fact and let me just read out this portion to you again because we've already established all the facts that happened that day yeah so we will not want to dwell in justifications it was your oh, fail okay. it was a failure on your part when it came to that issue correct oh okay Okay, um, uh, you as the commander, you've told us that mm -hmm. a commander always has control over his men. You as the commander right. had control over your right. men. You were the one that was ordering right. your men. Right. And you were the one that gave the order for them right. to shoot into the crowd of students. And you were the one that also gave the order for the arrest mm -hmm. of students. Correct? Right, right ma'am. So you will agree with me at this point, after all these points that we've established so far, you will agree with me that you provoked the situation. It's either oh, yeah, a yes, yes or no, Mr. Cissé. Yes, 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 yes ma'am. So you accept yes, responsibility I, for whatever happened on the 10th of April 2000? I, I take the responsibility. I take, I, I take the responsibility that whatever happened, you know, at that point in time, GTTI, the beating and uh, the chasing, the throwing, you know, of, uh, of tear gases, yes. That's very true. Because I was the officer commanding. And just to stress on this point and just to establish that um, this is actually what transpired at GTTI, um, I would like to mm -hmm. read another statement to you, the statement right, of a student right. witness. Mm -hmm. By 7.30, before we could start to move over into GTTI, officers of the PI pub, pub, Police Intervention Unit sorry, had arrived on the scene. They immediately started mm -hmm. asking, they immediately started to ask to speak with me. But I directed them to the Vice President, Alaji Dabo. Mm -hmm. whose statement I had read earlier. Who was the no. one assigned to speak with them? Mm -hmm. They were not willing to do that mm -hmm. and soon ordered that we disperse. There were about 25 officers and about 1,000 students at that time. After, repeated, after repeated orders for us to disperse, which you had clearly told us 
right we were attacked so in fact you and your men were in a situation where you had more students than the police officers you actually came with correct no we didn't have more i mean more police officers than this no so no i don't agree that the officers you you had were proportionate mm -hmm. to the students that were there at that time there were about uh, not more than 50 officers and the students you know they were more than 1000 so i mean the, the number is it's far more than what the number of people i came under what what we found on the ground so what i read out right now as to the situation that happened at gtti mm -hmm is actually true because this is also corroborated by the statement of Alaji S. Dabo that I had read out earlier. Mm -hmm. We did confirm that statement as well. No, no. Um, my issue here, my problem here is for them, or they have their opinion, but for them saying that they try to come under talk you know, I mean, to PIU personnel to stop. That has not happened. That has not happened. I mean, I want you to take it into consideration. I was the one who went on the ground <clears throat> and approached them, you know, I mean, to talk to them. Not them coming talking to me. I was I was going to be very pleased if I see anybody coming and talking to me. Um, this is what, this is what I was looking for. Yes, this is what the statement uh, provided. But then again, the issue of who mm -hmm. approached who is actually irrelevant mm -hmm. because you've already told us that the crowd mm -hmm. was peaceful mm -hmm. and yet you yes, attacked ma. them. Yeah, the crowd was peaceful. I totally agree. But why why we attacked them? Because they were disturbing the, the, the public order. And this was the reason why we dispersed them. Nothing else. Because they were disturbing the public order under the instruction, instructions, you know, we see way that go and maintain, you know, I mean, order. So I think I'm also in order when I see that, you know, a crowd that is even peaceful and that moreover again, moreover again, they were not even armed, even stones or stick, you know, with them to, to add it to my, um, to my verbal statement. But then the, the, the fact that, you know, they were disturbing the public order, the traffic at that particular, you know, at the time and the vehicles could that was the reason why I gave, you know, I mean, uh, my, my, I told my unit to disperse them. And the, during that dispersing, I agree, I totally agree that um, I have seen, because I was behind and running here and there, I could see some of uh, one or two officers, you know, beating them. I could see one or two officers chasing them. You know, I could see one or two officers, you know, arrested, you know, and apprehend, you know, I mean, some of them. All these things I'm not denying. I'm not denying. Honestly, I'm not denying. It happened. Um, Mr. Cisse, you did t tell us earlier that um, you told us earlier that you had 50 men. 50 men, About 50 under men your yes, command yes. on that day. Right. So it was not only right, one or two officers. It was in fact mm -hmm. all of the officers against the students that were guarded there. And you repeatedly told us that they were not armed, they were not yeah. armed. That means yep. you provoked the situation. You started Ma. the whole thing. Ma. And given the fact uh, that you had agreed um, on that point, mm -hmm. do you want us to go back to it again? Because we've already established that no. you were no. the one that provoked let's the situation. Yeah, let's continue. Let's continue. But then... I respect, you know, I mean, their statement and uh, my statement to, should be respected because my role, my duty, you know, to go there is to maintain, you know, public order. Even though the person is peaceful and uh, you are disturbing, you know, the order, I think my role as a police officer is to make sure that, you know, that public, that, that disturbance, you know, is disrupt. And that this is what I have done. Of course, as a result, as a result of me dispersing them, brought the provocation, which I will agree. I totally agree, but then I was doing my role as a police officer to stop, you know, discontinuing you know, the disturbance. So, so we can continue. I agree. So you will agree with me on this point that the manner in which you dispersed the students mm -hmm. 
provoked the situation mm -hmm. and the chaos that happened yeah, ob obvious. in ob ob obvious. Obviously, yes, obviously, yes, because I disperse them and then they start running and, uh, you know, it, it has it has brought us to another level. I that's, 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 that's true. That's something that, you know, we are seeing now. That's and, something uh, that, you know, that has happened. And you will agree with me that the manner in which it was done was unlawful and illegal. Um, you have the okay, ma, the I mean, uh, the commission... Um, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just go on, please. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, ma. I agree. Hello? Can okay, you hear so me? So we'll move on from this point since we have all agreed on this particular issue. Let's okay. go back to the students okay. that were arrested. Where were mm -hmm. they taken? Um, they were taken to Kanifin, to the office. Sorry? I didn't get your answer. My apologies. Hello, Mr. Cisse. Can you hear me? Mr. Chairman, the screen is frozen again. We're having a bit of a technical difficulty. Obi-Wan, can you help us here? Yeah, same. Um, can we have an indication from the OV van what is happening? Are they trying to restore contact with the witness? Oh, okay. Apparently, the witness's computer is still frozen. The image on the witness's computer is still frozen. So we would say whether uh, contact could be restored with the witness. And then we would proceed. Um, uh, Mr. Cisse, can you hear us? Yeah, it's still frozen.
Uh, Mr. Chair, I take over from Mariama. She's gone out to confer with the technicians in the OV van. Uh, but uh, in view of the current situation and in, the, in view of the fact that it's now 2 p.m., um, uh, I propose that we adjourn uh, our hearing of this witness until another date when uh, we would identify all the technical problems and would be able to address yeah. them. Yeah, it he's is there back now. on the screen. It looks like we can yeah. proceed. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, he's yeah. back on the screen. Uh, Mr. Cisse, can you confirm yes, sir. how much mm -hmm. time we can have with you for, the, for today? How much more time do we have with you? Um, as much as you can, because I, I'm, I'm, I'm free from now on. I'm, I'm free. We, we can, can proceed with you I, I have today. Okay. So, Mr. Chair, yes, you yes, have yes it? sir. That would be great. Um, we can continue and uh, see how, how far we can go, except if it is desirable that we adjourn with him and give him a rendezvous to continue another date. And in the meantime, we interpose uh, the other witness who's been waiting. Uh, we stand guided by your decision. He is here. He is able to proceed. We are also able to take another witness. Um, so I leave it to your discretion whether we continue with him or we adjourn with him, give him another date to come and continue. We take a short break. And after the break, we bring on another witness. We stand guided by you, Mr. Chair. We are indifferent. Any which way you decide, we will proceed. Uh, one component, if you can make that um, point clear, how much time do you need with him to finish? Uh, one hour, Mr. Chair? No, one okay. more hour? If you need an, an hour, then uh, I think we should um, take your suggestion end with him today and then uh, uh, arrange him to have him another day to complete his uh, reaction. And then we will take a break now, come back at uh, 2.45 um, and with the next witness. If that is okay with you on your logistics and other things, we that should is, um, uh, proceed accordingly. That is fine by us, Mr. Chair. And uh, for Mr. Cisse, we are sorry. You would have to come another time. So yeah. we would give you a rendezvous. Okay. Uh, no. We would make arrangements. Okay. Uh, so so okay. Uh, we would inform the commission when next you are coming. And we hope that by then okay. the, the technical problems would have all been identified and sorted out. Thank you very I much, hope so, Mr. Cisse. Let me hand over to, to the chair so that you could be discharged. Thank you very much, Mr. Cisse, for your testimony. We will come back to you uh, when we work out uh, the logistics. We will take um, uh, a break now and uh, come back at uh, 2.45. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> I'm <laughs> It will be a story of the Funokono, a pitiful Gambia Dow that pitiful Babel. It was a town of Dow that I sent for Tower. What a man, what a man. The other body was satisfied. I can't even
balwo sabis din kirala jampo o manken na kolea ko balwo sabis sal de mano ka je ko ale dumur fengol sang ala dimba ya moli ana lakanun tewul watu bela ani wat sudum fanan kono balwo sabis la din kiralu ani la do ku nyolu e banko karo beto kabirin carton fo koyna nalla fa ko ku ko tan so balwo sabis la kolto ali komande telephone la no la melbuko 9400213 7694319 wala 3192870 wala hankabi alta internet do alila kulu jibe www.baluo.com